the basement where nerdiness thrives and grown men rant about toys. It's been a while. It's been a while since we've done a fresh from the basement. Yeah, fresh from the basement is back after. Because uh, what happened was throughout the month of July, I pretty much worked all of July without a uh, day off. And Damn. that whole that whole month is a total blur. And uh, oh shit, the. Uh, the lunchtime, what do you call it? Here in Col break. Yeah, the lunchtime siren, the uh, every Saturday at 12 o'clock, a, uh, a siren test goes off, and you hear this man, this was a test, I don't know if it could pick up over here, but you know, I, I can hear it clearly in the house. But yeah, yeah, I've just been working my ass off there, but now our numbers are, are uh, down, and we're, we're actually just about getting less than 40 hours a week now. But, uh... But now we finally have time for another podcast. Your favorite list podcast is back. Yeah, man. This time we are doing the... What, is it top nine favorite TV shows? Yeah, just to fuck with you guys, we're gonna take off ten, make it nine. <laughs> nine. And now, like... <laughs> Odd number. There are so many shows that I watch that, uh, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to pick nine, but these are the easiest ones that I'm like, you know, this is crap I can watch over and over again without, uh, ever kind of being like, oh, I don't want to watch this anymore. Cause there are, there are so many shows that I do watch that I'm like, I'll watch the season and I'll never watch it again. Yeah, for me, it was kind of like the opposite, because, like, in the age of the internet, that's where I get a lot of my entertainment from, like, why would I watch a TV show when I could watch, like, Monster from the Studio or something like that, so, uh... Yeah, that's kind of how I am, too, you know, like, right now, I'm just watching a lot of, uh, horror producers on YouTube, like Rob Dyke and Rainbot and Scare Theater, like, I'd rather just sit around and watch all that stuff, and... Yeah, like, I'll try to get into shows, but a lot of stuff seems foreboding and stuff like that because I'm not a binge watcher I don't have like maybe I could get it depends on the length of the episodes but a lot of shows nowadays like the lengths are like one hour for each episode and I'm just like I don't yeah you know I'm like this. 30 minutes to me is ideal that's um, why I like movies because it's like yeah it's long but it's like you're in and out yeah and because that's a that's a thing that we'll get into when I talk about some of these uh, shows especially one of them because like I, I don't mind an hour long show, but it's like, I gotta have nothing else I wanna do. And yeah. that or, that or be eating dinner, you know what I mean? Like, fucking. Exactly. But I just need, I need a quick thing and just get back on with what I, what, what I wanna do. Yeah. So, it was kinda hard to pick the TV shows, but I have nine, so. Definitely. We should um, get into it. Who, who's going first? I guess we'll let you go first, man. All right, so my number nine was a show that ran on the Independent Film Channel. Uh, I know what it is. by John Favreau, and this was called Dinner for Five, if oh, you've I ever heard of it. Don't know. I thought you were going to I thought you were gonna say uh, Garfunkel and Oates when you said the, uh, the IFC. There's a lot of great shows from IFC. Garfunkel and Oates. The Henry Rollins show, um, but Dinner for Five, like you, you can now, like full episodes are on YouTube and stuff like that. They have their own channel now, um, and it's a show hosted by the great John Favreau, where he picks like four other celebrities just to sit down and have dinner with them, and they just shoot the shit, and it's really interesting. So just like. 
go yeah. through all these different topics, and it's always like a weird combination of celebrities. It's never like too fitting, you know what I mean? Like you'll have Bruce Campbell and like Faze on Love yeah. together, room together. That is rare. Um, or like Andy Dick, Daryl Hannah, and Marilyn Manson. <laughs> That's yeah, Marilyn awesome. Manson was a funny motherfucker on that show. Um, but I don't know, like, I just, I love watching interviews, and this is like the yeah. ultimate interview, because it's just them being themselves, just talking. And it's just, it's really interesting to see, like, what they, what they think, what they feel, what their views on stuff are, and just watching them just have a good time. Uh, what was another one I really liked? Um... Shit, I'm bad with memory. <laughs> so is it is it similar to that Jerry Seinfeld uh, show with the celebrities getting car or in a car getting coffee or some shit? Yeah, it's kind of along the lines of that. Just them just having fun. That's just pretty cool. Dinner. Yeah, there was one. There was like two episodes where John Favreau was busy because he's usually like the host for each episode. But they had two episodes where Kevin Smith was the host. Oh, that's rad. I watch and anything with Kevin Smith. His own, uh, or I think it was one where he was the host and one he was the guest. But the one where he was the host, he got to pick his own guests. So you had him, Mark Hamill, Jason Lee, Stan Lee, and I think I think that's it. Maybe one other guy who I'm like forgetting at the time. But uh, that was a really fun one. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of Kevin Smith on my list of favorite TV shows. Yeah. Um, but there's really not much to say. Like it's hard to like describe a show like this. Just go and watch it if you're into just celebrity culture and just filmmaking in general, just acting, music, any of that stuff. Because it's really fun just to see these people, just to see these people chill and just have dinner together. That's awesome. That is so something I need to check. You're number nine, good sir. My, I tried so hard, man so hard uh, to not let my list be filled with nothing but uh, British comedy and I I, I, I failed <laughs> like there's maybe what one two three all right well four out of four out of nine are not British um, but uh, my number nine is definitely it's got to be uh, X Files. Hey, it's a good show. Yeah, you know, because when I was uh, when I was a kid, man, when I was when I was a kid, I was probably like seven or eight. Uh, my family, we all started watching it uh, every week, and it was. Uh, I remember on Friday nights it would come on at nine, and then after that went off, we'd switch it over to Showtime, and that new version of The Outer Limits would be on, and we'd all watch that. And uh, I don't know, man. Spooky good time. Yeah, you know, and my my dad is a big uh, big UFO and uh, just kind of paranormal nut, and I I grew up into all that shit, and so I just thought it was cool. As, as a kid, I was like, yeah, man, you know, monsters and aliens and UFOs, and but then uh, my wife and I, man, we uh, we bought them all on DVD about ten years ago, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna pay attention now, you know, now that I'm not a kid. And, you know, there was a, it still held up for the most part. And even the, uh, the new ones that they did, what, about a year ago were really good. And now they got a new season coming out that, yeah, uh, I was... Yeah, I feel like X-Files is one of those shows that, like, never truly go away. Yeah, and... Like, it's left its mark on, on just pop culture. Yeah, definitely. And to me, other shows have tried to do exactly what X-Files did, but to me, the other shows aren't nowhere near as good. Like, uh, I mean, also, too, I think X-Files was, like, there to sort of fill that Twin Peaks void because it came out not too long after Twin Peaks ended, and you had David Duchovny, who played Dennis slash Denise on Twin Peaks, and... He's, he, you know, I don't know, he kind of has that, he's that same quirkiness on the X-Files as well. And the X-Files has a lot of that, uh, that visual style, the very woodsy, sort of rainy kind of, uh, look. At least until yeah, they... Yeah, but it's also kind of like, 
the Twilight Zone of its time. Just a really well crafted, methodical show. Yeah, you know, seriously. And to me, I know a lot of people hate. A lot of people would rather see the Monster of the Week episodes. And but me, I was I was really big into the uh, the main plot line of the show, so I would get aggravated because I'm like, oh man, on this episode something big went down. Smoking Man did this. That the alien bounty hunter did this. I can't wait to see what they're gonna say about it next week. And then for like three episodes, nobody acknowledges the big life changing events they just went through. And it's oh, just man, like the cigarette smoking man is in Antarctica now. He's <laughs> cloning his own versions of the thing. Yeah, in dude. A video game. And it's like, oh fuck, no, nah, we're not gonna acknowledge that, but we're, we'll throw you a Bigfoot. I was about to say, like, yeah, there's probably an episode with a fucking Yeti. Yeah, like just about any kind of, uh, even down to like poisonous mushrooms giving you a trippy, uh, trippy episode. And like, dude, one of them I remember is. The tobacco beetle, like, fucking really, like, dude smoking, and, like, beetles start crawling out of his fucking mouth. <laughs> some of them, some of them are pretty, uh, pretty ridiculous, but, uh, they, they're all enjoyable in a way. But, yeah, like, to me, the worst, the worst of the worst is definitely, uh, like, the last two seasons. Maybe, maybe the one, the first season that had, uh... Robert Patrick in it wasn't as bad, but that last one where it was just him and Reyes was... I was like, right now you're just trying to replace the two people I come here to watch, and it's just not working. Yeah. But, uh... That's why I prefer a lot of shows that sort of don't last long, because they last exactly how long they need to, or they're just canceled yeah. early, sad. To me, I think it was season seven, the season seven or the season eight finale, whichever one where Mulder had finally found out what really happened to his sister like to me that felt like the true ending of the show and but it's like no the show's too big we still gotta keep it going we need more money yeah <laughs> but uh yes yeah, so that's really all i got about x files i'm sure everybody's watched it but definitely check it out it's one that and that's another good thing too about the the random episodes that don't follow the main plot line is you could turn them on whenever and not have to pay attention you know and be like oh it's yeah. just a cool monster so like they kind of got it right but other shows kind of try to do that and kind of fail like Grimm I liked Grimm a lot but Grimm was wanting to be X-Files but not and you, you know, know they, they can't all be zingers like even with the Twilight Zone like a majority of the episode like when you watch when you watch the Twilight Zone like reruns on TV, they play the episodes you know you're gonna like. They play the memorable ones, like the Gremlin on the wing and shit. Yeah. And you forget there were a lot of like filler, not that great episodes. Yeah, to me there are many episodes of Twilight Zone I don't like. I think the one that I could think of that I hate the most is the one with the the Agnes lady who's just real clumsy, and that angel dude is supposed to help her not be clumsy. Like that's that is like yeah. seriously the worst. Yeah, you know, like I said, they can't all be zingers. Yeah, but uh, what is your number uh, eight? My number eight did horribly when it premiered, and not even a lot of the episodes were aired, but it still counts, damn it. And keeping up with the Kevin Smith tradition, it's Clerks the Animated Series. Dude, that show was great, man. I really wish they kept going with it and they gave them a chance. Again, like we talked about it, because I was re-listening to the underrated uh, themes one, our first episode, and we pretty much pointed out there. It's like they pretty much signed with the wrong, with the wrong network. Yeah, what was it, NBC? NBC is not, ABC is family. Clerks is not family. You should have been on like FX if that was around at the time or fucking... Uh, yeah, but that was before Central. FX really became the FX we know today, too. Yeah, like, they should have been on, like, Comedy Central or yeah, fucking dude. Uh, Cause comedy. That's where I first saw the Clerks cartoon was Comedy Central was playing the reruns for a long time. and it. I saw it on Adult <clears throat> Swim. Yeah, see, like, it had been great on Adult Swim. Or if they, the show came out, like, a year too early, you know what I mean? Like... Yeah. If it would have come out for Adult Swim or Comedy Central, 
I think that show would have thrived. You'd have probably got at least three seasons. Because they got great talent on the show. They had Paul Dini, who fucking worked on the fucking Batman animated series, who gave us, like, some of the best Batman stories. He was, like, one of the either, like, producers or writers on it. Mm -hmm. Like, like he had some A-class talent come in to work on this cartoon series. If you watch, like, the behind-the-scenes on the DVDs, like, all the storyboard arts, it's like, just because it's a comedy doesn't mean they didn't take it seriously. Like, they had a lot riding on this. Yeah, and it took advantage of the fact that it was animated. Like, everything was real exaggerated. Yeah, and it worked in that matter. I love how they, by the last episode, they even poked fun. That's like, we're going to try to make this feel like the movie, and then anything, like, like nothing like the movie. Like, he wakes up in the Matrix. <laughs> yeah. And, and, like, I remember when I first watched it, right, I was like, this show doesn't need a villain. You know, you had Leonardo, Leonardo come up in there. Yeah. And, but then, toward the end of that series, I was like, that motherfucker's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty funny, and you got fucking Alec Baldwin playing him. Yeah, seriously. And then this fucking plug, his sidekick, who is definitely not a robot. <laughs> yeah, man, seriously. And, like, the, I like how just everything in the show, like, especially, what was it, they put uh, George Lucas on trial. Yeah, that the court episode was probably the best. Or if not, the best episode is the second episode where they're flashing back to the first episode like they had yeah. this long history. It was that, it was the, the it, pay, poking fun at your bullshit clip shows that uh, sitcoms like to do a lot. Yeah, I was just watching Friends, and they did, a, they did a fucking clip show episode, and I was like, they ran out of ideas or they ran out of budget for this episode. Yeah, it's like, I don't understand. They, they, they do clip shows just to sort of fill up the season order, you know? It's like, oh, we got to do 25 episodes? Crap. Here, do three clip shows and, you know, 22 standard shows. Yeah. And uh, one of lazy. my, one of mine on the uh, the list actually probably has one of the better clip shows that I've seen. Like if it's by like the end of like the the show and you want to show a little clip show, go right ahead. Or maybe if you have like one flashback, but when an episode just pretty much the writing process is how many fucking like lead-ins to a clip show can we write? It's yeah. like a musical, but instead of leading into a musical number, it's like, how can we lead into a flashback? Seriously. But, um, Clerks the Animated Series had a lot of untapped potential that if it just lasted longer, like, some of the concepts for future episodes that they were going to do were pretty fucking hilarious. And I'm glad that they kept the original cast, too, how they didn't recast Dante and Randall. Yeah, uh, they the brought back Brian cast Holleran is there. And, uh, and was... Anderson. That's one of the rarest things for a either a TV show or a cartoon based off of a movie property to have the actual cast show up and and play their characters. That that right there, you know, the thing I like about Kevin Smith is he loves his friends. He loves his he just loves movies and he likes just talking, man. He's one of the most inspirational dudes that I could sit around and just listen to all day. Yeah, like, in terms of, like, just listening to people talk, it's, like, him and Henry Rollins, I could just listen for hours and just just sit back and be like, preach, man. Yeah. Because they just, they're good speakers. They just know how to, like, talk to an audience. Like, speaking of Kevin Smith, uh, <clears throat> his Fat Man on Batman podcast, they did uh, commentaries for the first four Batman movies. From Tim Burton yeah, to Joel Schumacher. Yeah, I remember I, I was watching Batman Returns, and I was like, you know what, I'll rewind this back and fucking listen to it with the commentary on. Like, that, those are hilarious. Those, those yeah. are real funny. Um, the thing I like about him is, like, yes, people could, like, argue that he's sort of a sellout, because nowadays you see him everywhere, like, like, selling his merch. Yeah, like, but... He just seems so down-to-earth, though, and, like, yeah, he's one of us, man. It's he's like, a fan just like us. That's like he's really not a sellout. Because he deserves it, you know. He's wor he worked he his feel ass like he's off. Better than us. He yeah. Doesn't like. He he like came he's off. He's not wearing sunglasses constantly in like a big <laughs> suit. Like oh no, you peasants! I'm above this. Yeah, you know he he never forgot where he came from, dude. And 
that's that's something that is uh, rare with anybody in Hollywood, and and we've really seen him come out of his shell because, like, when you watch early Kevin Smith interviews, it's like, yeah, you could talk, but he was always sort of like kind of awkward. Yeah, kind of, like, yeah. When, when you watch and then that he uh, smoking weed. Yeah, when you watch that first evening with Kevin Smith uh, movie, yeah. um, he's on stage and it's like, oh man, dude, this. It's like you are not well at speaking to people, but at the same time, it's like you're saying some of the most interesting shit. And well, but, that's what kind of makes it funny is that he's just coming straight out and like just just talking. Like I still think he was good at talking. I just feel like the cadence and the way he like played to an audience. Which, in a way, his dryness kind of, like, really helped. But, funnily enough, he didn't start smoking weed until he was 38. So, like, yeah. Marks and all those movies went by. Jay started getting better with his drug addictions. And then, fucking Kevin started smoking weed. And now we have the Kevin we know today, who's just yeah. all over the place. And, dude, his uh, his Jay and Silent Bob Get Old podcast is fantastic. You get so Oh, yeah, I used to listen to that, like, constantly. Craziest stories told by Jason Mewes that's like, wow, man, this motherfucker really dig this shit. Yeah, and, uh, what's it called? I have a couple of those DVDs, too, because they, like, record some of the live podcasts they do. So I have the one where they go to Ireland and the one where they go to Britain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dan Silent Bob get Irish. Um, but yeah, that's a great podcast. Dude's got a ton of podcasts. He even has, like, one with his wife where his wife just shows off like what she buys or something like that. <laughs> Dude just loves podcasts because for a while he like retired from filmmaking and yeah. focused mainly on podcasting because it was easier and it's how he can get his voice out better. But then on the Smodcast, another great one, he fucking like was really high and they came up with Tusk. Yeah, man. And I love the crap out of Tusk. I do love Tusk, Yoga Hosers, I'm not gonna lie, it was kind of shit. See, I haven't seen it yet, um, and so I don't know, I, I just know everyone that I know hates it, and I'm like, ah, yeah, like I, I'm sure it I can't be the, as bad as Jersey the, Girl. I kind of like how people left The Phantom Menace, where they're just like, I, I, me and my friend looked at each other, it's like, I guess it was good, I guess, because we were just sort of in shock and awe, but nah, it's his worst movie, it really is. Yeah, even worse than, uh... Was it Jersey Girl? It is at least Jersey Girl, like, has heart or something like that. At least it's, like, trying to be serious or something uh, like that. I have it. I've yet to see it. But I've actually heard some Jersey Girl, uh, Jersey Girl defense. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll be on the defense of it. But then again, I'm one of those guys who will most likely, like, buy yoga hosers because they just want to own all of Kevin Smith's movies. Like, I do own Cop Out and shit. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't even seen that one. Uh, I'm probably never gonna watch it in my life. I just have it to have it. Yeah, you know, it's. I'm the same way with uh, with music. You know, it's like even if a band has a shitty album, you gotta have it if you want that uh, that the full, completeness. Yeah. Because I try to do that. It's like I have them stacked up in a row, like the the three greats that come out of the '90s. I have like the Kevin Smith collection, the fucking Tarantino collection, and I gotta get going on my fucking Robert Rodriguez collection. Yeah, definitely. Because they were like the big three. But yeah, Clerks the Animated Series was also my introduction to the Askewniverse. Because I, I was really young one night, and I stayed up late and watched it. And the rest is history. True that. But yeah, that is my number eight. Alright, my number eight is, uh, man... Like, I don't have them in a particular order, so I'm looking at this list, like, which one do I talk about next? Well, yeah, I wouldn't say, like, like, this is not going to be, like, the definite list for the rest of my life, but these were the ones that popped up into my head when I was thinking. Yeah, exactly, so. like, but number one is definitely my number one favorite show of all time, but the rest are shows that I really like, uh, so I'm going to have to say number eight. Is uh, God, it's gotta be Faulty Towers, man. With uh, I knew this was gonna be on the list somewhere when you said British comedies. Yeah. <laughs> Goddamn, Faulty Towers. <laughs> John Cleese, dude, like John Cleese is Basil Faulty. Like that is one of the funniest freaking British shows, and just one of the funniest comedy shows ever. Like it's so, uh, it's so chaotic and so 
he is so abusive to uh, his uh, his help, man. That I think it was Manuel. I can't remember the 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 Spanish guy, man. Like he's always just slapping the shit out of that dude, and but like I I don't know, man. I me and a uh, well, Stas, my my wife, man. She worked at a uh, chaotic groom shop for a while that. You know, it's kind of like when I watch Faulty Towers, I'm like, that's that's almost the boss that uh, ran that place, man. Just so uh, so freaking out there. Well, that's another thing that like makes a show great is like when you can sort of relate to like the comedy of it. That's like maybe it's a little more exaggerated, but it's like you you get it. You know, what I mean, like it just it resonates with you. Yeah, like there was the one episode where the guest dies. And they're trying to hide his body in the whole episode. Like it's like, dude, just call the police, man. <laughs> <laughs> but see, it's like dark shit like that, but done sort of slapsticky. Yeah, like, like it's <clears throat> like you could either go one way or the other with it. It could either work, or you could have fucking Heil Honey, I'm home. Have you ever seen the pilot to that show? Yeah, I have seen the pilot to that, and I'm like, you know, I get what you're trying to do. But, but what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, I, I totally, I totally get what you're trying to do, you know. If this was like a YouTube video, yeah, it would be fucking hilarious. Yeah, it's like you're it, trying to market this on TV as an actual like franchise. Yeah, dude, if it was uh, actual satire on like Funny or Die or College Humor, you know, because I can see them doing shit like that all the time. But like as one skit. But yeah, like, exactly. Whole series, it's like this is gonna like. Yeah, as a whole like, series, it's like you people were expecting to do like twenty-two episodes of this a year for God knows how long. Yeah, that the dude it's like, the, you're, like this seems like something like they make in the producers or something like that. Like, yeah, springtime for like, Hitler. Like a sitcom now. And it's like you know, the sadly. It wasn't executed. It was it was executed poorly, and it just wasn't yeah, funny. Yeah, and that only makes it sort of more offensive. Like my stance on comedy is like, if you could word a joke well, if you could structure a joke well, you could damn well make a joke about anything, and I won't be offended. Like you could make a joke about fucking anything, any horrible shit in the world that's happened. If you know how to write, structure it, and make it clever, go for it. But if you just come up and be like, hey. How about that Holocaust, am I right? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, it's just disgusting. It's like, damn it, man. You guys you guys tried and you failed and... Yeah, there are people who don't try or there's people who try too hard. Like, you gotta get, like, that perfect, like... Perfect shallowness, but at the same time, like, a perfect humbleness, too. Yeah, and, um... You like be cynical yet, like, yet humble. Like, for instance, you know, with... The, the That's My Bush show, you know, um, that uh, the South Park guys had made, like, that kind of mirrors the uh, the Hitler show in a way, and, but, yeah, I mean, like, they're two totally different things, but, you know, you got, you got a leader, and it's more of a workplace comedy as opposed to the, like a family man comedy. Yeah, where, exactly. Where the father is Hitler. And with the annoying neighbors, you know, and oh, they they got to be Jewish, and they're the Goldbergs. Like ah, Fuck I don't God. know, man. That shit was awful. Like you're just pulling at your fucking like collar, like oh, this is. Uh... Yeah, the premise ran dry in the first minute. I mean, I had an idea for a movie once that I. I'm kind of scared to say this because this might get me in trouble, but like one of my friends came up with the idea of the whole reason why Hitler was evil was because his mustache was telling him to do it the whole time. <laughs> and I, I made this whole plot around it where it's like he's looking in the mirror and you just get this really fucking like big zoom in on his mustache, like camera shaking, like kill the Jews. It's like, no, I would not kill the Jews. It's like, you know, you want to. Dude, like whole, that would be an amazing, uh, that would be an amazing little short film. You, yeah, a short film, but the thing is, I was writing, like, I, I was destined to write, like, a full feature. Eh. It would be, like, my Inglorious Bastards, and 
thank God I didn't go through with it because holy shit, I think back, I'm like, there's no way I would ever, like, maybe his mustache grows like a giant tentacle and he's, like, walking around like Doc Ock. I don't know. <laughs> All I know is I would have followed, we would have cut back from Hitler and his shit to fucking, uh, like, Americans trying to hunt down Hitler. And, like, one of them is Jewish and out for revenge and shit. You have a scene and where he tries to... Between the two storylines. He tries and to shave Hitler it off. the reason shot himself is because he... It's not because the Americans were coming down hard on him. It's because he's, like... He shot himself right in the mustache. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And then the two fucking American characters walk in and they're like, Shit, we just missed him. <laughs> you know, there is... Slight potential in that. <laughs> yeah, maybe for like a skit, but it's like I was going full feature. Like we'd wake up, <laughs> we'd we'd open up the film with like fucking Hitler as a kid and shit. And he's got and a mustache. Slowly then. see this mustache start growing. Oh my god! And I think I was gonna name it Springtime for Hitler, just as a reference to the producers. But there's no way. <laughs> yeah, like you're just sitting here taking this all in. This was like, what year of school was this? This had to be like ninth grade. This had to be like some juvenile shit. <laughs> oh, so shit. pretty much, like, if anyone wants to like animate this, if anyone's a fan of like the fucking podcast, like if you want to see this, like animate it on your own or something. But I don't think I'm ever gonna do this because I grew up and I was like, that is fucked <laughs> oh shit all right so what is yeah, your uh, this shit. <laughs> what is your number seven my number seven is another kevin smith show this is the last kevin smith show i swear and i'm not really a big fan of reality tv i kind of find it annoying but this is a reality tv show that i really liked it's comic book men uh yeah you know you know, I I like things about that show, but at the same time, there's some shit in there that I think is just cringeworthy. Yeah, it is, but it's like I, I watch it every time it's on, so... I watched the first or at season... Least every new episode. I watched the first season and then a couple episodes into season two, and... You know, to me, the most interesting stuff was when people would come in there with uh, with items and would basically, they would talk about it and give you the history on the toy or the comic. They would comic pretty much be like pawn stars. Yeah, you know, and, but then you would get shit like, oh, we're standing around in here and <sighs> you could tell some of this dialogue is so written. It's not them being yeah, themselves. Yeah, that's the thing, because these people aren't actors. They're not like Kevin Smith. Like, Walt Flanagan played, like, half the extras and clerks, but he was never, like, really an actor. But that's kind of the reason why I like the show, though, is because it has, like, those those flaws. That's just, like, it has such, like, humbleness. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it's like, motherfucker, I don't know. Like, <clears throat> when, when Jason Mewes comes to hang out at a store, it's like, you know, for... Some reason I'm just not believing this. You just, you guys said, "Hey." It's the first thing he comes in. He's like, he just, he's B and J, not Jason Mewes. He's just coming yeah. like Snooze to the news. Yeah, it's like, then he's playing with the toys and shit. I don't know. It's like it's. Well, at the same time, I kind of see Jason Mewes doing that anyway. I do too. But they had him acting so. Oh, yeah, it is clearly all scripted and shit like yeah, that. Yeah, it was like... They've been on record saying that it's scripted. Like, they, man. like, there's no denying that. Every reality show is. And then, but, like, there's the episode where they go to... They're supposed to go to some convention. And, but it turns out they had the wrong address or the wrong date or something. And it's like, oh, well, let, let's go to a yard sale. And they go to this random yard sale. And they happen to have a, a bunch of Mego... Um, action figures, and it's like, oh man, we gotta get these Mego. I'm like, there's no they way. They just happen to have these rare yeah. Mego figures. There is no way this really happened. Because and they're probably mint in box too. 
I mean, like, you gotta be kidding me. But, I mean, I, I did enjoy the show for for most of it, but just some of the, uh, like, especially when they tried to do their, play their hockey game in the back, I'm like, oh, quit emulating clerks. But it's, fun, but it's funny because these are the people who, like, shut up, dog. These are the people who, uh, who, like, were the inspiration for clerks. Like, Brian Johnson is fucking hilarious. Yeah, because... The podcast is great, but, uh, what's it called? Yeah, was I don't know, it? I just like the whole... Brian like the whole was the original archetype for uh, Randall, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's cool. I mean, those dudes are real cool, but, like, there's just... Like I said, like, to me, the show is, like, half good. Yeah, but it kept my attention, so... Yeah, that that's all that really matters. And, like, there's some interesting shit in there, man. It definitely is. Whenever they have, like, a celebrity come on the show, that's great. Yeah. And, like... As- what was that? I remember when that one dude was trying to sell that Godzilla, that big ass Godzilla action figure, and they're like, "Wait, the, isn't his tail supposed to move?" And Did, oh my god, fuck him! They make Walt Flanagan like the stingiest motherfucker, like when it comes to dealing prices. Yeah, dude, and that's what's so funny about it because it's like it's like a standoff, pretty much. Yeah, and they they make they try to make it so suspenseful, dude, and it's like. It's so funny, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. I'm like, shit. come on, Walt. He's like, well, you see, there's like a rip on the side here, and uh, there's some wear and tear there. It's like, this fucking, this dude needs money for, like, some serious shit. Yeah. This yeah. guy's like, I need this to feed my kids. They're like, well, I can't have it. <laughs> it's just going to sit up here on the shelf. Yeah, no one's gonna buy it. <laughs> but that is my number seven comic book men. <laughs> Not a bad show though. Not a bad show. It's one. Of- also, how Kevin Smith like barely appears in the show. He's only at like the beginning and the end. Yeah, he's at the beginning of the little podcast deal, and and it's like they're just kind of telling him about what happened at work that day. Yeah. And it's like, hey, Kevin, man, we, we, we went to a yard sale, and dude, they had Migos. And Kevin's like, what? What the hell? Wow, they had yeah, Migos. Yeah, always just so full of fucking, like, energy. <laughs> yeah, everyone else is, like, so chill. You, and then another thing, too, is, like, you know, Kevin Smith cusses. You know, every other word is a cuss word. And you can see him, like, just trying real hard to kind of Not watch to. his mouth. <laughs> It's like, oh man, if we, if we weren't on AMC, man, you know, I, I could, I could say a little more like I want to say, but. <laughs> yeah, well, everyone like I used to be into The Walking Dead, but while everyone was like up at night waiting for The Walking Dead, I'm like, dude, I got Comic Book Men like on DVR like right after this. Yeah, like so. to me, I hate reality shows, but that's one that uh, is one of the more interesting. Uh, I guess really because they talk about shit that I care about, you know what I mean? And also just because, I don't know if it's because I'm a little biased, but it's like it's from a person that I really like. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I'm a fan of, so, you know, of course I'm going to check it out. Like, even though I find reality shows to be, like, cancerous, I may watch, like, an episode or two of the Osbournes just because it's funny seeing Ozzy Osbourne being out of his fucking mind. Yeah, dude, we watched the hell out of that when that came out, and... I enjoyed it when I was an early teen, but nowadays I'm just like, wow, that was a thing, man. That was a yeah, thing. You, you got to read Ozzy's autobiography, like when they get to that chapter in his life, just like <laughs> how that all went down. It was, it was pretty crazy. But it, it has some of the most uh, quotable shit, dude. Like fucking, you had like one of the one of the greatest lines ever that came out of that show was that uh, bubbles. I'm the fucking prince of fucking darkness. <laughs> I remember the episode where he was trying to fucking work a TV. So he just calls on Jack, but he's like, oh, it's the fucking weather channel. Oh, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah. It was like, you know, some of that shit was kind of funny, man. Like, it really was. And like, even dude, like, like Jack would be a... Uh, when when Kelly had her little song come out, and you had Jack <laughs> saying some fucked up shit to her, like they were they were driving around, and like there was a sign for the McRib at McDonald's, and he's like, "Oh my God, the McRib is back!" 
And so, like, Kelly's talking shit, like, really? That was kind of dumb, you know? And he's like, well, Kelly, you know, we're not all big rock stars. Uh, you gotta love the little things in life. I'm like, Jesus Christ. This episode brought to you by the McRib. Yeah, exactly. Here, here, telling you that the McRib is back. But yeah, Comic Book Men was my number seven. Seven, Kevin. Uh, you're up to your number seven? Yeah, my number seven is uh is Frasier. You know, my mom is actually rewatching Frasier recently cuz she went through friends, she rewatched all of that. She's like, "Well, what else is on Netflix?" So she's actually been like binge watching Frasier. I could totally see why you chose this. It's a fucking hilarious show. Yeah, it's it's probably one of the probably to me like my favorite, uh, like American sitcom with you know your your standard laugh track garbage and all that and you know because we watched all the Cheers and uh, you know Cheers is good but to me Frasier is just way better like I don't know what it is but Frasier to me was just a character that uh, when he was on Cheers uh, it was real funny and so for him to have his own show with seeing him deal with his family, you know, uh, there's a lot of funny shit that goes on there, like, especially because of him and his brother, his brother's on there, and they're both these it was really... It kind of a spin-off show then, because Cheers yeah. came first. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a spin-off of Cheers, and... Uh, so it's kind of like the anti-Joey, that it actually went somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, definitely, and freaking, like... It's just a dry wit of it, it's like my kind of humor to a T. Yeah, and you're watching, you know, this dude, he tries so hard to be this real sort of uh, classy kind of, uh, you know, he's a very pompous dude, and he's surrounded by just kind of, you know, everyday people, and, you know, they don't, they don't understand him, so, you know, you get a lot of comedy gold with some of the crap him and his brother talk about, you know, and they're next to these people. They're like, you know, I don't really give a shit about that, you know. Like his yeah, it dad. Also comes down to it. Also comes down to casting. Just like if Kelsey yeah. Grammer wasn't Frazier, like it would still probably be good, but not nearly. Yeah, there's some about Kelsey Grammer, and even the dude that plays his brother Niles. Like their uh, their chemistry together is hilarious, and uh, even their dad, man, the guy who plays Martin Cray, and he's a uh, He's really good because you get a lot of uh, a lot of good comedy there because their dad is like uh, you know your normal kind of freaking dad, and but he's he's got these two sons that you know he wanted to play sports with, but they wanted to uh, you know be freaking you know talk about operas and shit you know so you got a lot of uh, a lot of humor there you know and he's like you know this is why we never played ba uh, baseball in the backyard you know shit like that it's really funny yeah but yeah it's one of the yeah, best uh, I, like I knew about it but it was nothing I really watched before until I noticed my mom like like yeah I catch it on TV sometimes but once my mom started like binge watching like I would come down from my room like get something to eat but then I would like stop and it's it's mesmerizing, dude. I'm like, this is such a clever show. Yeah, it's uh, it's real funny. It's real damn funny. Um, like they're they try to they try to host dinner parties for the the town elite, and you know shit just goes wrong. And he uh he 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 runs a little radio show, um, like a talk radio show, where he's trying to people call in, and he tries to help them with problems. You get a lot of uh, a lot of funny shit there, and. I, there was one episode in particular that I thought was great because, you know, he's a real pretentious guy. And they, they said, you know, Frazier, we're going we're gonna to let you come up with a jingle for a little theme song for your radio show. And he's like, oh, man, this is a good idea. So he winds up making this outlandish, big, orchestrated freaking piece and he's just got all these people in there playing the playing the instruments and shit and when it was over uh the little station manager was like wow and i just wanted you to make a little four five second jingle man you know yeah. but, so you got a lot of funny shit like that in there 
it's just funny. It's like the funny, like kind of pretentious. That's like yeah, you know, you're where you can just sit and laugh at it. Like this dude pretty much just wrote a concept album for a yeah. Music. He's so full of himself, and but it's not like it's not mean spirited about it. It's like yeah, it's like he just doesn't know anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um. So what is your number six, man? That was seven. That was Fraser. Uh, that's another podcast Kevin Smith does is uh, Talk Salad and Scrambled Eggs, Fraser Reconsidered. That's uh, really good. I'll uh, have to check that one out. I didn't know that one existed. Yeah, I don't know if they do any more uh, of them, though, because there's like, they were supposed to do talk about every episode of every season, but, you know, that's like 11 seasons. You know, that's a lot. But uh, they got like 22 episodes of that podcast. Um, but, uh, but yeah, what's your number six? My number six is one that didn't last long again. It only lasted three seasons. Uh, but this is called Penny Dreadful, which, uh, the reason I got into it was because it stars my favorite actress, Eva Green, but it also has a fucking great cast because much like Star Wars, you got the three main characters, right? So you got fucking Timothy Dalton. He's on there? Josh Hartnett. And Eva Green, and it's based around all of these like old horror characters, like because uh, a Penny Dreadful is like in the olden days, like books full of like horror and like sexual stuff and stuff like that. It was sort of like frowned upon. Yeah. So it's like this new age, like done in a good way, unlike Twilight. It's like a new age, like re like reinterpretation of these classic literary characters, like you see Doctor Frankenstein. Uh, Dr. Jekyll, um, you know, Frankenstein's monster, who has a great, like, character arc. And it pretty much revolves around these three characters, like, amidst all this, like, madness and stuff like that. Uh, Dorian Gray is in it, and uh, if you know that story. Yeah, with the mirror and... Yeah, he's a sick fuck in that show. (laughs) Uh, And the way they sort of, like, weld in some of these characters, like, there's a character in the show who you don't expect to become what she becomes but once you like realize like who she is like in the later like in like the second season it's like wow that was a great like transition into the classic character yeah she becomes you know that was a show that i haven't seen yet but i've been meaning to check it out yeah it's it's really good it's really well made I still have yet to see the final episode though because i know what happens and it saddens me um, I wish it lasted longer, but the reason I'm not, like, upset that the show ended was because it wasn't because they were getting low ratings or that, like, yeah, they the just, like, just ran out of ideas. Huh? They concluded the story. Yeah. They had nowhere else to go. And, you so know, that's... they lasted exactly as long as they needed to. Yeah, that's, that to me is always with better when a show does that, because it's like, if you know where you're going to end, just do it. Don't. Don't beat a dead horse, you know? Yeah. But I still wish it sort of lasted longer because, you know... I don't know, if I remember correctly, there might have been, like, loose plot lines that still needed resolving. I I guess I'd have to watch the rest of the final episode to see. Um, But there's just so many, like, classic horror movie characters you could have gone into, too. You know what I mean? Like, it would have been sweet to see, like, The Invisible Man... Or it would have been sweet like, to get the Gill Man on there. Yeah, like get into that shit, but I think they ended perfectly because uh, by the third season we're introduced to a character we've been waiting for for a long time, so I don't really want to say much because it's one of those shows that you don't want spoiled for you. But Yeah, especially because I, I plan Green, on checking it out, definitely. Eva Green, as usual, gives her like chilling, wicked performance like she... She's one of those types, sort of like Bill Murray does his same sarcastic, sarcastic shtick in every movie, but it never gets old. She is just good at playing these tormented, like, not vicious, but like, really like, wicked is the perfect word. She's just, she has this like, darkness in her voice and in her mannerisms and in her look that is just riveting. Like, her performance and her, like, character arcs really, like, pull the show through. All of them are really well-developed characters. You really start to feel for all of them. 
Yeah. And again, it goes down to cast. That's like, you got three people who I really like. Like, whenever I see them in a movie, even if the movie's bad, like, I enjoy that they're there. Like, Josh Hartnett, fucking... Josh Hartnett's an American who gets, like, roped into all this. He's like the fish out of water. Uh, and Timothy I think, Dalton yeah. plays, like, this British explorer who like explored most of Africa and stuff like that. Yeah, I didn't even know Josh Harnett was in there because dude, I have not heard that guy's name in like over ten years. Yeah, well this is what he's been up that that's what he was up to for like the past like two or three years. Because the last time I, I really remember seeing him was at the very beginning of uh, the Sin City movie. Yeah, well, there was also 30 Days of Night, but did that come before Sin City? I, I really don't know, because I never saw 30 Days of Night. That's a good movie. You should check it out. Josh Hartnett does really good in that. Uh, but yeah, Penny Dreadful, and it's just a well-directed show, too. Like, the look and style and feel of it, it's just all so gothic and, like, yeah. it's classy, though. You know yeah, what I, I like mean? That it, kind of you, shit. it really brings you back to that, like, classic era of horror, just done a little more, like modernly, you know what I mean? But it still feels like you're watching, like, the oldies. Yeah. Like, uh, because, you know, a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of horror TV shows out there now, and, you know, I'm eating most of them up. Yeah, uh, Penny Dreadful's one of the more classy ones. That's awesome. But then again, you'll also have scenes where, like, people are fucking and, like, spitting up blood on each other, so... <laughs> But I'll let you see it for yourself, because it, it hooked me and my family, so that was my number six. All right. I got to check that show out for real. I've been meaning to for a couple years now. Um, Either you can find it on DVD. I'm not sure if it's on Netflix. I think it was at one point. Hmm? But if the, any chance you get, yeah, definitely check it out, because you'll have a damn good time. Sweet. Um, so what, am, am I on number six now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my number six is The Black Adder. Good choice. Really good choice. See, I can see what you mean by it's hard, like, not to pick British comedies, because they got some good shit, man. And, like, Black Adder was, like, the complete opposite of Rowan Atkinson's Mr. Bean. Like, it's yeah. too completely... Di like, Mr. Bean was the physical comedy where, like, in Black Adder was the... The, the words, wordy comedy. Yeah, wordy and situ outlandish situations. Um, but, yeah, like, I, I love Mr. Bean, but Black Adder is, like, to me, the best. Because I love the, the way the show runs because... You can do so much with it. Every season, it's almost like they're just being reincarnated through the ages, you know? That yeah. The first season is like in the in the Dark Ages, and he's kind of uh, slimy in that one, but it's uh, it's really damn funny. And but it's all it's all it's weird because like every every year, it's almost like he uh, his life gets a little better because in the first season, he's just like the the shitty son. And that nobody likes, and then the later seasons, you know, he but he's like the butler for the queen, you know. It's like he's he's going up there, he's climbing the ladder, but barely. And um, but yeah, dude, like one, you have you have that where every season is a different uh, different age, so you get different um different historical jokes for uh for the time periods that uh, they're in, like uh. Especially when, to me, when Hugh Laurie joins, joins the cast. Um, I loved uh, <clears throat> the character Perseus. Was it Percy or Percy? Um, that was his, uh, his first little buddy for the first couple seasons. But that guy quit and they replaced him with Hugh Laurie. But uh, there's a weird <clears throat> sort of thing. I don't know if they were doing this on purpose... But, uh, if you really, if you think too deep about it, it's, uh, all right, uh, for the first couple years, the Black Adder's buddy, I believe it was Percy, man, I might be so freaking wrong, but, uh, he's, he's Black Adder's little sidekick, and, you know, Black Adder's always screwing him over, 
every time they get reincarnated. Well, finally, in one of the seasons where uh, that actor isn't in there, he shows up during uh, the, Scar the, uh, the French Revolution, and he's the Scarlet Pimpernel. Um, and that dude's real name was Percy. And so, basically, he winds up accidentally getting poisoned by the Black Adder and freaking dies. And so when you look at it, it's like, could that be the same Percy reincarnated as this, this big historical figure only to meet up with Blackadder one more time and get screwed over? You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's like, if that is, that's some really fucking clever comedy and, like, ironic stuff. Yeah. Um... One of my favorites is the Christmas episode oh, because dude, because he's a good guy and everybody needs yeah, him it's to like be an a asshole. Yeah, of the Christmas Carol where it's like instead of learning to be good, he learns to be as like fucking rude as possible, and he does that joke where he's like, uh, "I got you a fist," and the great thing about it is you could use it again and again <laughs> and again. And he just keeps punching him. Yeah, dude, the Black Adder was great, and then that theme song, dude. That theme song is epic. Yeah. Fucking. Dude, that shit is fucking rad. And, like, it just. When. God, I forget which. It's been a while since I've seen any of them, but the, the season where you had the fucking queen and they're on that boat. And when he comes back, she's like, you know, I, I hope that you got me something. You better have brought me something, you know, cool. And, well, they didn't have anything except for these bottles that they pissed in. And so he gives her the bottles and tells her that they're this, uh, this fine wine from, uh, from some fucking place, dude. It was hilarious. But yeah, I can totally see why you're sticking with the British comedies. Because, like, once you go there, like, you never, you can't stop. Yeah, like, and there's just so many... There's just something about British comedy that just has its own, like... I guess, like, it makes you feel smart while you're watching it, but at the same <laughs> time, it's like, there's just such a, like, pacing to it that, like, I can't describe. Yeah, they have such a way of... Because the shit will be real smart, but then at the same time, it can be real juvenile, but in a real smart way. Yeah, exactly. There's just a timing to it. And it's it's odd, man. It's odd, and like you know, there's still what three more British shows on my list here. Oh shit! Keep them coming, then. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Black Adder, man, and that's another one. Like the final season was uh, World War One. That one was great, and uh, even a little darker in ways. Especially the uh, the last shot when they finally, you know, they're like the whole season. They're just down in the. Uh, <clears throat> the bunker in the trenches and <clears throat> fucking finally uh, the last fucking shot they're uh, they're like all right i guess we got to go up and friggin fight the good fight and uh, it's playing the the theme song all uh, slow and shit and it just freeze frames and it's like oh and then that's where they you know what happened after that they uh, fucking died yeah they all got fucking blown the fuck up or shot they got mustard gas they <laughs> threw up their own intestines and they died horribly yeah it's a good way to end. Yeah, seriously. And he's he's thrown out the idea of possibly doing another series. But yeah, I was he, about to ask, like, would you want to see that? Because you still there's still so much more history to go through. Yeah, there there definitely is. Um, <clears throat> and it's like he had he mentioned before because they did a couple specials that I haven't seen. Like there was one where he he was like in the dinosaur ages or some shit that I have not seen, but uh, he did say before that he didn't want to do any more because he didn't want to, you know, be 60 years old and playing that character, which, you know, makes sense. But I, in, a, in, a, in a world right now where, like, every old classic show is getting revived with the original cast, you know, that's one I wouldn't mind seeing, at least, uh, you Or know. at least, like, another special. Yeah, exactly. Like, give me a nice two-hour episode, <clears throat> and we'll we'll go with that. Yeah. 
Like, do one with, like, I don't know, the 1940s or something like that. Yeah, see, that would be cool. He could be, like, you know, hanging out with some uh, bootleggers, you know, and during Prohibition or something. Yeah. But we don't want to go into World War II, World War II, because, yeah. mm, hail honey, I'm home. Yeah, because, I mean, number one, they already did World War <laughs> One, so it wouldn't make sense to do World War Two. I mean, yeah. you, so, like, <clears throat> maybe, maybe, you know, just something around, you know, maybe do one around the, uh, the 60s hippie era, or, you know, you could do one during the Prohibition and, you know, gangster area or something, uh, you know, something like that. Yeah, that'd be great. So what is your number five? My number five is a show that we've actually dedicated a whole podcast to Samurai Jack true that and we still gotta fucking review those last episodes yeah but even like the early episodes dude like from season one like the show like you may have a couple of filler episodes but the show never really even the filler episodes are good though no they all had their artistic merit and good pacing timing yeah uh and good animation, even when, like, in the first seasons, when the animation was at its cheapest, it still had, like, this quality to it. Jack, even though he's silent for the most part, like, he's just such a likable... He's just, like, the essence of anything that's good. Yeah. And then you have Aku, who's, like, one of the best, like, villains you'll have in a TV show, because he's, like, threatening while also, like, funny. Yeah. And it's also down to, like, good casting, good music, and just good talent. Just Gendy Tartakovsky just knows how to make good shit for all ages. And that's why it really pisses me off that the fucking Popeye movie he wanted to make was yeah. fucking put on ice because of the Emoji movie. Yeah, and have you seen the uh, the test footage for the Popeye movie? It's pretty... I might have seen bits and pieces of it. Either way, still, a Popeye, an animated Popeye movie it's pretty impressive, like... Like, if you're gonna do it, like, it's easy to roll your eyes, like, oh, okay, just another property we're gonna fucking, like, milk money out of. But when you have good talent behind it, this could be, like, the next, like, Tintin, you know what I mean? How it was actually made with, like, love... Oh, um, man, Tintin was the great. Material. The, the Tintin movie was fantastic. Because I used yeah, to watch... You got people like Spielberg behind it who, like, Dude. actually, like read these books and shit. And then, and then you gotta love that they chose Simon Pegg and Nick Frost to play Thompson and Thompson. Like, come the hell on. Yeah, exactly. Like, dude, that movie was great. Like, cause I loved the show when I was a kid. I remember Nickelodeon used to play it all the time and I was always watching it. And, shit, that movie was great. <laughs> They're supposed to have a sequel come out sometime and, you know, I'm, I'll be happy with the one. They did the one so good that even if they don't make the sequel, I'll be happy with that. Well, because they were like books first. I yeah. Think, the t- and and uh, look, and the way Spielberg like found out about it is that a lot of like foreigners were reviewing fucking like Raiders of the Lost Ark or the Indiana Jones movies, and they kept like he couldn't understand the language, but he kept seeing this one thing like Tintin. He's just like, what this? So they're all saying like Tintin. What is this? So then they like gave him the books, and like Spielberg fell in love with them. Yeah, that shit was real good. That's my little piece of trivia. But yeah, just Gendy Tartakovsky in general is one of, like, the best storytellers of our time, visually. Yeah, exactly. Visually like, and and He's just a good emotions. filmmaker in general, just because he knows the language of a pure, just visual. Yeah, and I... He did those hotel... Transylvania movies. Transylvania movies, which is some of, like, I can't stand Adam Sandler, but those movies are really good. I really yeah, like I haven't even movies. seen them yet. They're actually really good. The pacing of them, the animation, it, even before I knew it was Gendy who worked on it, like, I still like, I still like them. One, because it's like, it's a kiddie horror movie, so it like, it appeals to weird kids like me, but, uh, and gives, like, little kids, like, introduction to these characters. And at the same time, it's, like, the comedy is, like, just juvenile enough, and also Adam Sandler's actually putting on, putting effort into what he's doing by actually doing 
a fairly decent Dracula voice. Instead of just doing like the, I'm Adam Sandler, give me a bunch of money. Yeah. They say this weird voice. Yeah, yeah. he is annoying. Samurai Jack is like Gendy's best work. Like, he, this is what he'll always be like treasured for. That and like the Star Wars series. Which is another one I still haven't seen. Yeah, the Star Wars series you could watch like all in its entirety, both volumes on YouTube in like this three hour epic. Um, I don't know, it's just, the animation style really works. Even, like, the complaints people have with the later seasons, like, when the when the fifth season wrapped up, you know what, I still loved it. I still liked it for what it was, because it put a fitting end. Yeah, 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 and, like, you character. know... To the I... <laughs> just, he's, he's kind of got, like, a childlike wonder to him, so it's like... Yeah. He gives it his all, and he just, like, he does whatever he wants. That is the truth. Like that dude. That dude is great, and yeah, totally agree with a uh, Samurai Jack there. It's fantastic. Plus a great theme song by Will I Am. Will I Am before he before became he totally a fucked piece himself. of shit. Yeah, <laughs> but you gotta love. Gotta get back, back to the past, Samurai Jack. Watch out, Samurai Jack. <laughs> I have to bust out my scare whenever I can. You gotta do the scare moose, man. <clears throat> scare moose, so man. So, what is your number five, babe? My number five is the original Twilight Zone. Mm. The old. I guess I hinted man. at it before. I was on to you, Travis. Yeah, you were on to me, man. You know me too well, bro. I could read you like a book. Yeah, I'm like not a very deep person. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, it's a good choice. Twilight Zone is like, even though I said this before that like, yeah, there's a lot of episodes that don't work. The thing is, is like the episodes that work really fucking work. Yeah, man. Yeah. And like, like I said, the only one that I really didn't like was that bullshit ass. They were, that was even a backdoor pilot for another show about that angel helping people. I'm like, no, there's just no way this can work at all. Like God. But, uh. But no, Bob like we were. Sterling is just like a genius, man. Dude, like, man. He, just these ideas he came up with. Yeah, and especially like in those times, some of that shit, some of these episodes of Twilight Zone are still relevant today. Uh, yeah. Most of them. Most of them are. Like, you know, the, the episodes about conformity and like even a lot of the episodes you know just did not have happy endings like one i i always forget the title of the episodes but the one in the last season where the uh the alien brothers uh move into the uh, little little neighborhood and their their mission is to poison all the water and kill the world because there's no good in the world but the one alien meets the girl and he likes her and he wants to foil the plan, but it's like, no, nah, we've already put the poison in the water, and now we've captured you, and they don't believe you. And so then it ends, and it's like, oh, all these people die and, uh, are dying tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's not afraid to, like, hit you with those apocalyptic endings. Yeah, man, and then, you know. Which also leads into the fact that we have to thank Rod Serling for more than just the fucking Twilight Zone, like, Without him, we wouldn't have Planet of the Apes. Yeah, Planet of the Apes with, like, you know, that is such a Twilight Zone twist. Yeah, you, you know, maniacs. That is, that right there is his uh, his uh, written DNA all over the place. Because if you watch a lot of the Twilight Zones and you see some of those twists like that, you're like, dang, you really, you really see his... Uh, his genius come out more with Planet of the Apes because the whole time you watch, especially if you watch Planet of the Apes for the first time, you don't know the twist. You're like, oh, this is just a movie. They're on a planet with these monkeys. But then you yeah, see the end, and it's like, well, god damn, that changes the whole movie. And yeah. uh, but like we were talking earlier, like shows are a lot of shows are better at 30 minutes. Like Twilight Zone, for instance, they don't waste any time with the 30 minutes they're given. They they, they give you everything you need to know. It's short, sweet, to the point. Exactly. And when and, it hits you with that twist, you know, 
I think James Rolfe was just reviewing uh, the Planet of the Apes movies, and he said, like, if you just cut down a little bit of the Planet of the Apes movie, like, cut out a little bit of the filler parts, put it in black and white, gave us the intro and the end credits, you'd have, like, a perfectly great episode of The Twilight Zone. Yeah, yeah, that's damn true. Uh, Because there were were so many episodes that mirrored Planet of the Apes. And, uh, but... With when it comes to like the other show that Rob's uh, Rod Serling did was uh, with it, Night Gallery, I yeah that was his follow up show. I like that okay, but it's an hour and you get two you get two stories in that hour. But it's like I just need the one story for thirty minutes, bro. I don't need yeah. the whole hour. Even Outer Limits, man. I try to get into Outer Limits. That hits an hour. Even uh, Alfred Hitchcock that was presents. Also, that was also Sterling, right? Uh, I don't know. No, that was uh, that was a Twilight Zone copy show, I believe. Uh, it might have come out right after Twilight Zone. Um, and even like Alfred Hitchcock presents, like that's trying to do the same thing, but you got an hour and like it's good. But to me, none of them are as good as that original Twilight Zone. Nobody could do it like they did. Uh, yeah, and then everyone tried to... Everyone tried to copy it with these sort of uh, anthology shows yeah, and stuff like, like and, and then it got to the point where it's like we started using the slasher movie villains as the hosts when we had, like, fucking Freddy's, Freddy's Nightmares. Nightmares dude. Like I wish they would put that on DVD or something. I actually bought a bootleg of it at uh, one of the recent, like, conventions I went to. Like, that they is awesome. You could find, yeah, look for them at conventions, because they do have, like, Friday the 13th series, uh, fucking Freddy's Nightmares. Th- that day, I bought fucking Freddy's Nightmares and Extreme Ghostbusters on these boot- pretty well-made bootlegs. That's awesome. And, like, you know, when it comes to the horror host, right, you know, you got Rod Serling, and he's just so fucking classy, dude. He's standing there, he's got his cigarette, he tells you what you need to know, and then at the end, he gives you a little little quip at the end. But, like, on the very first episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, is like, Alfred Hitchcock is just spending too much time explaining what this show is. It's like, he's like... This is a show where we'll show you weird people doing weird things, and I'll pop up from time to time to tell you about it. And it's like, dude, we know you're doing it now, man. Like, you don't need to tell us that you're going to be here. Like, come on, dude. Like, I can't see Rod Serling being like, hello, I'm Rod Serling, and I'm going to show up at the beginning and the end of every episode to sort of explain to you what happened. It's like, dude, come well, on. Well, it's two different styles. Like, that kind of feels like something Alfred Hitchcock would do. Yeah, it's but it's like, like dude, like Alfred. But I guess for a team, that's the reason why it's an hour long, because he always has to explain. I've always got to explain to the meaning of the show. But, dude, you got to love the theme song as for the Hitchcock events. As possible. As slowly as possible. Like, but the theme song for, uh, for, uh, at the Alfred Alpha Hitchcock presents is great. That, do, 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 do. yeah, dude. Like, that was another thing, too, though. Like, that, the Twilight Zone, all right, Night Gallery, Outer Limits, and the Alfred Hitchcock one, they all have great openers. Like, those are real great opening, uh, bits. And then we start to get the fucking anthology shows for kids. We got fucking Goosebumps and yeah. Are You Afraid of the Dark. And I loved those. I loved those when I was a kid, too, man. Yeah, those were a good, like, introduction to horror. But then, like, when you look back at them, you're They're just They're pretty like, damn cheesy. Wow. <laughs> but it's like, yeah. I remember I used to have, like, all the Goosebumps books that my cousin lent me. But we had this... I might have told the story on the podcast before, but we had all the fucking Goosebumps books you could imagine. Yeah. But the covers freaked the fuck out of me. Especially Man. the Living Dummy. One of them were the yeah. cover, just its face staring at you. Sometimes the covers were better than the books. But we had to return them back to my cousin because they were literally scaring the fuck out of me. <laughs> and it sucks because I wish I kept those books. Because I'm sure if, like, when I got into, like, like fourth, fifth grade... Fucking, like, maybe, like, early middle school and shit. Like, that would... I'd read fucking all of them. Hell, I'd probably go back and read some of them now just for the fun of it, just to see. Because R.L. Stein's not necessarily a bad writer. He does what he has to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? He makes simple, 
horror stories for kids. And I respect that because, you know, not a lot of people want to scare kids anymore. But it's like some people, like, you should expose your kids to pretty much, like, any emotion at an early age. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, so not I guess too they much know how to deal with traumatizing, them, but something that, like, eases them, something that gives them, like, chills down their spine. Yeah, I mean, you're not like, going to show your kid any, uh... Yeah, you know, don't show your kid any David Cronenberg as soon as uh, you know he's out the out of the womb. Yeah, but, you like, know, like, let him read some R. L. Stein or you know, like yeah, br- bring him up slow. Like, my my parents had us watching you know the early Universal horror movies when we were really yeah, really like young. that shit too. You know, if I imagine myself being a father, I wouldn't be like. Like you said, like Cronenberg out the womb. But <laughs> yeah. if I know that the fucking like, if I know the kid could like handle some stuff, I might like play like maybe an R movie around him. It just depends on the age and if like he's ready for it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, I would be like loose, but also like responsible. Yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, that's probably what I would do. I'd probably be like, hey, you want to watch fucking Frankenstein? It's a really, it's a, it's a really good movie. You know, it's still kind of creepy to this day because it's like. Very quiet. Yeah, man, like that, the original Mummy and all that stuff. Even like, I Dracula still to this man. day, man, Best Invisible Man is that first Invisible Man ever made. Like, Oh, yeah, Claude Rains, all the way. Um, but, yeah, Johnny like... Johnny Depp ain't got shit on Claude Rains. Yeah, what are they doing? But, uh... They're doing the Dark Universe, man. The Dark Universe, man. They stole yeah. my idea, because I want to do sort of a cinematic universe where it's not necessarily, like the mummy or the like invisible man but it's like a world where this shit is like almost like there's maybe like more than one you know what i mean like we have a vampire who's his own character who's not dracula you know yeah the frankenstein monster because there's only one frankenstein monster but you also have like a wolf man yeah like someone who's suffering the same thing as the original dr jekyll and mr hyde and shit like that and you have this sort of new adventure in a modern day yeah, they, like they ruin that possibility. With sometimes, this sometimes when you modernize some of them, you wind up with Doctor Jekyll and Ms. Hyde. Yeah, but yeah, like even with anthology shows too. Like there were some really good ones that uh, were are fairly modern. Like to me, one of my favorites was Night Visions, hosted by Henry Rollins. <laughs> <laughs> What? Yeah. You stole me. He hosted a fucking anthology show? Yeah, dude. I think it used to come on Fox, man, but Fox just did not market it at all. And there were some really good, uh, really good episodes there, man. And yeah, Henry Rollins would come up at the beginning of the episode, say a little quick thing, and then at the end of the episode. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Henry Rollins. Fucking. <laughs> <laughs> he starts out calm and just starts screaming at you. Yeah, it was like, Cause I'm a liar! Yeah, it gets all red faced. Like, dude, that, that was a really good one, man. And like, and then I have to show that to one of my friends too, because he's the one who got me into punk rock. I mean, like, do you know fucking like I know Henry Rollins hosted his own like talk show on the i on the Independent Film Channel, but like, do you know he hosted like a fucking like anthology like horror show? Yeah, it was called Night Visions. It was pretty rad. Yeah, I'm looking that up like the moment after we're done with this. <laughs> it was pretty good, man. There there was an episode where. Uh, Fucking this serial killer was, during the summer was killing some people, and they were like, "Why can't the serial killer take a weekend off?" And the guy watching the news was like, "You know what? Maybe I should take a weekend off." And you know, that's if you ever see it, that's all I'm going to tell you because uh, it was a. That was sounds like cool. comedic gold. <laughs> it was pretty good, dude. And, Jason, and then he had like Jason takes a vacation. Yeah, yeah. You had you had like uh, in one episode that was really cool had Bill Pullman in it. And uh, I think they were like these military guys, and there was this window. They were in the desert, but there was this like window, uh, like a force field around this nice looking family, and it would open up for a little bit so things could go through. And the the Bill Paulman just becomes so obsessed with it, and yeah, like the the twists were kind of cool in it too. Like to me, it was one of the better uh, modern anthology shows that. Uh, came out because like you know how they're you know how they're doing it now where the anthology is like we'll give you a whole season of something to me that's a cool yeah, idea I just got the when i went to the movies to see gun dunkirk we got the fucking trailer for american horror story cult wow they're gonna show that on in the movies 
Like, well, it was like the before the trailers, you know what I mean? Oh, they yeah, yeah, the yeah. TV show trailers. trailers what the trailers? Uh, one, I thought after Roanoke they were done, and second, it was like, really, it's like they did Coven. What's really. Yeah, Coven what's going to be different about your cult? But they're still kind of similar. Yeah. Um, but it's a bunch of clowns because, you know, clowns are scary. It's like, I feel like we've. And then we got the It trailer after that. Yeah, which, see, like, clowns are just in right now, you know? And with every year, you got all the dudes dressing in the clown outfits, standing on the side of the roads. You know, clowns are just in right now, you know? So, yeah, but it's gotta be clowns. In this, in this clown cult, do you think we're gonna get a fucking cameo by the insane clown posse? Possibly not, but... Probably. But that would be funny if they're just sitting there. Yeah, but this will be the every Juggalo's favorite season, just Pretty because much. clowns, just because clowns. Juggalo Jones. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, man, like uh, yeah, Twilight Zone. What I don't even remember what number that was. That um, was uh, number five. Yeah, it was five. All right, so what is your uh, what number is this four for you now? Yes. All right, what is your number four, bro? Right? So I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy and, like, that whole scene. And one of my favorite comedians, probably one of the best comedians of our time, is the great Louis C.K. So ah. my number four has to be the show Louis. That show was great. Yeah, I don't know if it's, like, done now or not, because I know he's doing, like, another show called Horse and Pete with Steve Buscemi on his website. That's wow. done sort of like a sitcom, except it doesn't have the laugh track, but it's filmed in the same style without a laugh track. Yeah, because well, I think we watched the first three seasons of Louie. The last one I saw was when that girl, he like, just randomly died. I have to watch that again, because I haven't watched that. That might have been in like the third season. I remember watching the fourth season when it premiered. Dude, I one of my Doug favorite Walker episodes. Is best in his list of favorite TV shows, that's like... People always, like, said that Seinfeld was a show about nothing, when really it started out as a show of how a comedian gets his material. And you can use the same argument for Louie, but Louie really is the show about nothing, because shit just happens, and then the fucking episode ends. Yeah, like, and it's it's cool the way they, especially in the first couple seasons, where it would kind of, like, it would be, like, random scenes, you know? And nothing but in many ways, that's just life. You know, you just walk around and just shit happens. Yeah, and you're just a... stuck in the awkwardness of it. That's what I love about it. It's because it's like a perfect translation from the shit he talks about in his stand-ups. Like, there are bits that he put in his stand-up that they bring to life in the fucking show. Like, he did one bit about the fucking Cinnabons and how the fucking syrup on Cinnabons is like jizz. And he passes by a fucking Cinnabon shop in the show that's called, like, Jizzy buns or something. And I like how that show isn't afraid to uh, get fairly dark. Um, oh, yeah. Like, when he meets this girl and she freaking gives him a blowjob in the car and then just kind of forces herself on him uh, so he could damn eat her vagina. And uh, it gets pretty intense there. It's like, whoa, are we going here? Like, just a second ago, this was, like, all all funny and blah, 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 blah. But then now it's like, oh, shit, I got a little serious here. And in the awkwardness, you just start laughing because it's, like, it's just so fucking awkward. But, uh, like, the episode where he's about to have sex with this girl and she likes to be spanked. And she keeps calling for her dad and then she just starts fucking crying, like, <laughs> weeping, <laughs> just totally just hard, just fucking bawling, and Louis just sitting there, just with his fucking face, that, that wide-eyed, just, oh, face. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, should I keep doing it, or? And she's, like, just fucking wailing into her fucking bed. <laughs> like, there was one dude that, one episode that made me laugh real hard, or one skit, I guess, but, where he goes to the dentist, and the guy knocks him out, and he starts having this dream. I believe he sees uh, Bin Laden, and he's like, you know, you're a real asshole, you know. And then, like, Bin Laden just starts rubbing his face with a hot dog and shit and shoving it in his mouth. And then Louis wakes up, and uh, the dentist is, like, zipping up his pants real quick. I'm like, oh, my God. 
Not to mention when you get those episodes where, like, other comedians cameo, like, fucking Ricky Gervais was his doctor in the first season. Uh, one of the best Matthew Broderick performances in the first season where they're filming The Godfather Part 4. Yeah. Starring Matthew Broderick. Yeah. And the one where uh, Louis and, uh, was it, Dane Cook, they kind of, they kind of... Yeah, they, they talk about, like, the controversy of stealing jokes. Yeah, and, like, they kind of squash their beef there. I think there was also an episode with, like, Robin Williams in the third season. Like, they got some big, like, names on here. I remember Chris Rock was in an episode. It just gets the comedian, like, community. Like, it, it, I think it represents it well. Jerry Seinfeld was in an episode or two. Like, in, in the first season where they had those uh, round table, like, fucking poker games. Yeah, that was really like, cool. Comedians. And that, that right there did not even feel scripted. That just felt like they had those dudes there just shooting the shit. Yeah, and they wanted to make it, like, feel... They wanted to make it feel special. So any other show, they would start, like, every episode like that. Like, that would become, like, the shtick of the show. And they, like, talk about this in an interview, like, I think on Opie and Anthony, like, and Louie was talking about this, how it's like, any other show would have ran with that. And every episode starts and ends with the poker games, and then you have something else in between. But he's like, no, I just... I wanted to put those sketches in, like, randomly, like, whenever I felt it necessary. Yeah, I enjoy how they they show you that, basically, he's living the dream, but he's not, like, a big name, you know what I mean? Like he's, he's No, he's still a guy. He still yeah. deals with the everyday shit. He's doing small clubs, you know, and... You know, he's just doing this to make his money, you know? And then, like, his daughters are really funny, too. They're they're real freaking funny on there. Yeah, but also, luckily enough, like, take a shot every time, like, fucking Louie gets laid in these shows. Like, he always <laughs> ends up fucking someone. Yeah. But by, like, the fourth season, it just cuts to him. Like, like they're just talking, and all of a sudden, it just cuts to him, like, fucking her, like, in this time lapse. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think season three was the last one we saw. I hadn't seen any after that. Season four is pretty fucking funny. Uh, what was the fucking bit I was thinking of? I love the first episode where he goes in to kiss the girl and she just flies away on a fucking helicopter. Yeah. That was the first episode. Um, also, the fucking, like... I remember if it was sort of like an on-and-off like friendship relationship with uh, Pamela Adlon's character. Where it's like, you could honestly see them, like, becoming a thing, but they never really do. Is that the girl that sort of was, like, real free-spirited? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one that randomly died on the last episode of uh, the third season. Is that the one? Yeah, it's like they meet back up, and they have a little bit of fun, and then all of a sudden, like, I think they're on the <laughs> bus or something... All of a sudden, she just starts bleeding out of her head, and then, like, the last couple minutes of the episode is is her in the hospital, then she dies, and then he takes a trip to uh, some, some fucking foreign country. And it was like, wow, you guys just did it on a real dark note. Yeah, and surprisingly enough, that's like the, the little tan girl, right? The fucking, the... That's the one we're talking about? I cannot even really remember which. I remember she had, was it brownish hair? I can't even really remember. Yeah. This was years ago. She's great. She was just fucking, like, because she has her own show now. She just was, like, nominated for Emmys now for, like, best performance and stuff like that. She's great. And a little bit of trivia, if it's Pamela Adlon we're talking about, she was the one who voiced Bobby Hill in King of the Hill. Wow. And they had a show before this in 2006 called Lucky Louie, which was more of a uh, was more of an HBO sitcom, but it was like really fucking dirty. Yeah, you know, I swear they they don't they do a skit about that or talk about that on the uh, the Louie show. I bet, but I feel that show was really underrated. It only lasted one season, and I found it fucking hilarious to the point where I was like looking at my me and my cousin were watching it once, and I was just like. We should, like, do, like, a Kickstarter petition to, like, get a season two done, even though it's been, like, years. But Pamela Adlon played his wife in that show. So, like, they've worked together in the past. They just have good chemistry with each other. Huh. But, yeah, Louie, there's just something special about it. It's, like, I think it's the perfect, like, I know everyone loves Seinfeld, but I feel like this perfected the idea of, like, a show about how a comedian lives and stuff like that. Yeah, Seinfeld is just funny because 
you've got these horrible characters who go into these situations that just escalate into madness. Yeah, but with Louis, it's like everything's madness and everything is just like depressing and fucking. But it's not like don't pressing matter. It's just it just happens. Yeah. He always has like that jazz music playing in the background. <laughs> fucking the Christmas episode. The moment his kids leave, he like fucking throws the Christmas tree out the window. <laughs> yeah. Like he's just he's just trying to live. <laughs> That is my number four. That is your number four. That is my number four. So my number four is another British show. Shock. Yeah, shock. It's the IT crowd. All right, explain this one. I have not heard of this one. Oh, it's great, dude. It's on Netflix as well. It's about... Um, these two guys, one of them is, uh, I believe he's Scottish or Irish, and the other guy is, uh, is a real nerdy guy, and they, they work at the IT department um, for this big company that you really never know what the company does, but uh, this lady, uh, Jen, starts to work with them, and she knows absolutely nothing about computers and stuff. And it's it's really just about them, you know, hanging out in the uh, the basement of this uh, building, and you know, going through crap. And like I don't know, like they're they go they get into a lot of awkward situations that are uh, real, real freaking hilarious. Like there's one where they all go to this play, and uh, fucking they're all talking shit about like oh only gay people go to plays, you know, blah 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 blah, and. Well, they they go there, and the one guy, the the Irish guy, he uh he has to go to the bathroom, and all the bathrooms are filled except for the handicap bathroom, and so he he goes to the handicap bathroom, and he goes to uh, flush the toilet, and instead of flushing the toilet, he pulls on the uh, the help uh, rope. And so once once he realizes that he did that, the people are knocking on the door. Hey, we're, we're gonna we gotta come in here and help you. He gets on the floor, and they're like, "Oh my God, what happened?" And he's like, "I fell." And they're like, "Where's your wheelchair?" And he's like, "It was stolen." And so they give him this wheelchair, and for the rest of the episode, he's got to pretend to be crippled. And then he winds up getting grouped up with all these other crippled dudes that are there. And they're all, like, you know, cheering for him and stuff and all this. And, like, it just, the, the situation gets real out of hand. It was really damn funny. And their, uh, their boss at the, uh, the company, it started off with uh, this other guy who was uh, real loud and obnoxious. But then he winds up killing himself. And so his son takes over, and his son is fucking hilarious. He's like this uh, real exaggerated misogynist, and it's it, it's fucking comedy gold, dude. Like, but one of one of my favorite characters on the show is a dude named Richmond, and he's a fucking goth. And the the two guys tell the girl, they're like, "Look, man, you know, just don't open that red door while we're gone." Well, she goes in the red door, and there's, like, this extra room in their basement, and the goth dude is in there, and he's talking about how this is his job, and he just watches these lights flash, and you don't get a lot of him in the series, but when he's on screen, it's some of the funniest shit. Like, there's one where, when they go to the funeral for their first boss, uh, they're all getting ready for the funeral, and he walks out, and he's got this, like, Day of the Dead kind of face paint on, you know, just looking like a skeleton. And the the Jen is like, please don't tell me you're wearing that to the funeral. And he's like, oh, there's a funeral? <laughs> but, uh, like, one of, the, one of the greatest, probably one of the funniest scenes in the whole series uh, involving him is, I can't remember what it was, but she was asking him for something, and he ran away from her into the bathroom. And she runs into the bathroom right after him, but he's not there. She's like, where the hell did he go? So she walks out, and the camera pans up, and he's up on the ceiling like freaking Spider-Man. Like he can climb walls. 
and then it just cuts away and like they never acknowledge it again and it's like wow I guess that's just the thing he can do <laughs> yeah yeah that's a that's a great show man if you can ever check it out like so it seems like it melds just like it does stupid well yeah it does it does stupid well and you've got these characters that they just get into these awkward situations and they they make the situation worse like that's that's some of my favorite shit right there is uh <clears throat> you know getting into uncomfortable situations and how these characters sort of act out in these uh situations it's uh really damn funny but uh moss he's the uh the real nerdy guy he gets trapped in uh, one of those claw machines because he saw an iphone in there and he wanted to steal the iPhone, and so he gets trapped in the damn claw machine, and it's like, how the hell do you get trapped in a claw machine? Like, there's no way you could even fit in there. And uh, they all kind of forget about him. And there was a, there was a real long, drawn-out dr joke that to me is, is classic, where the, the Irish guy sees a buddy of his from college, and his buddy's, like, doing real well. And then the buddy leaves, and he's like, well, shit, I, don't ask me how I'm doing, huh? Well, later on, this window washer goes to wash, his, uh, wash the Irish dudes. I always forget his name. Wash his windows. And then leaves his, uh, his bike and all of his window washing equipment there. So this dude's on the bike with the window washing shit and the ladder on it, trying to find the dude. And then he runs into his old buddy again. And his old buddy's like, hey, what's up? And he's like, oh, I'm not a window washer. You know, I'm not a window washer. I'm doing really well. And he's just like, whatever. And then later on, he gets trapped on the roof. And uh, he's up on the roof all day. And then this window washer is up there. And he gets on the little lift with the window washer. And they're going down real slow. And... He sees his buddy down there, and he's like, no, it's not what it looks like. I'm not a window washer. I'm not a window washer. And then, like, it gets real awkward because the window washer is standing up there with him, and it's just going down real, real slow. <laughs> so then, like, finally, at the end of the episode, he gets the dude, his old buddy's number, and he calls him up, and he's like, look, man, you know, I just wanted to tell you, you know, I'm not a window washer, I, I work in the IT department, and he's like, oh really, that's cool, he's like, yeah, and the guy's like, so, so what do you work on, do you work on Macs, and he's like, no, I don't really mess with Mac, I mostly work on Windows, <laughs> that shit's great, dude, that shit was great, real, real drawn out, but like, the payoff was, was epic. Yeah, it's one of those things that's like, it draws it out for the sake that like, once you get that fucking like, punchline. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, it's kind of like, cheap, but at the same time, it's like, really damn right, funny. you got me. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that was my number four, the, the IT crowd. Like, definitely check it out. It's on Netflix. In fact, most of these, uh, British shows are on Netflix. Um, and so what is your uh, your number three? All right, my number three, you know, it's easy to be cynical for some American sitcoms. And, you know, I get when some people have criticisms about this show. But, like, ever since I was young, I've always been into this show. It used to be my number one before another show with a similar premise came along. This is that 70s show. Ah. Uh. You know, I get it. Not a lot of people like this show. I... It's either you love it or you hate it. I thought it started I, off pretty good, man. Because we watched it like religiously when it first came out. But to me, I the mean, quality the early seasons are the early seasons will always be the best. Season yeah. two, the first episode of season two was one of the funniest fucking episodes you'll ever see because it's the episode where the fucking parents get high. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you had that reverse. You had uh, you had them at the table eating dinner and it's doing the uh, you know that that center camera you know spinning around. Yeah, just around seeing and... Red Foreman being high is the funniest yeah. thing. <laughs> but I think it also comes down to casting again. Like it comes yeah. down to casting. It's like these jokes still could have worked, but it's like the fact that you had fucking like Kurtwood as fucking Red. You know, you had 
what's his name? Uh, Topher Grace as Eric. I'm not a huge Ashton Kutcher fan, but, you know, this is what he was made for. He was made for this character. Mila Kunis being the annoying bitch. <laughs> Fucking uh, Laura Preppin as Donna. It's like they just have good characters, and that's what I go for. And also I just get wrapped up in the world. Like when I was in my full-on, like, old soul phase as a kid where I'm like, I wish I was born somewhere else. Like I just felt so wrapped up in the seventies. <laughs> I was like, I wish I was in the basement doing that shit. And then you reach your teen years where you kind of are in the basement doing that shit. <laughs> and it doesn't matter really what time period you are. Like there's always going to be teens like that. Yeah. Not like... to Danny Masterson is Hyde, who was probably my favorite of the kids. Yeah. Just, yeah. He like was we all want to be Hyde. Just the one who doesn't give a shit about anything. Yeah, he was a badass. Like I, I, they a lot of the drug humor got watered down, or to the or to the point where it wasn't even in there anymore in the later series. And but and like, it's not like the drug humor was really that accurate to begin with. Yeah, it's like, like when they're smoking weed, they see the walls moving, man. Yeah, like, see, those not, were great, man. Those were some great, it's a great scenes. Bit, but it's like that's not what happens. But yeah, it's, it's not. It's not more of like that's what happens it's more like that's kind of how you feel yeah and that that was uh that was really good to me like that was you know and the the ridiculous conversations they would have at that table you know when they would be stoned and like those to me were some of the best parts and then when you had fucking tommy chong on the show oh, uh, later on God. dude yeah man <laughs> Yeah, he was pretty and great. You couldn't have picked anyone better to play like a hippie on your sitcom. Yeah. Uh, and Kitty Foreman's kind of like the cringeworthy mom that like you just She's you an alcoholic, so man. That but, like ass laugh. She's a straight up alcoholic that's like it is it almost makes you wonder, is she like a recovering alcoholic? And she oh, yeah, just there's some slips dark up. shit going on like behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah. And that's why when we get into my number one show, it's like it's another show that's like very similar premise but like takes it to that level but um yeah i just always liked the show the first season i think it's pretty underrated because it's where it's getting his footing but a yeah. lot of funny moments were in that that the, the first season, season to me is one of my favorites just because it it talks a little more about some of the more um unpleasant things that were had i mean it doesn't get too unpleasant, but it does talk a but little still, more. Still, like talks about the unpleasant things going on in the seventies. Like there's there's a gas crisis going yeah, on. Yeah, and the the plant that uh that the dad works at, uh, you know, shuts down and shit. Like there's some pretty heavy, I mean not not really heavy, but some pre for a sitcom for a family little sitcom, there was some pretty uh, heavy storylines in that first season. That to me, but they... then by the later seasons, it's like this year this could have took place at any. Yeah, and exactly. And I, I own all the seasons on DVD just out of, like, love for the show. But, like, yeah, the later seasons get really... they Not, like, bad, but just uninteresting. Yeah. It's just one of those cases where it's, like... Usually, like, the fucking, like... First episodes of each season. The season premieres usually stay memorable to me. Because if I'm not mistaken... The season three premiere was a big parody of Reefer Madness. Yeah. <laughs> and they recreate that fucking movie, and that's funny. Where you have fucking Aston Kutcher being the dude who's just laughing his ass off <laughs> in the corner. Yeah. Yeah, and like they, like he was fairly he was fairly funny on there. Um Yeah, he was like the perfect level of dumb. Yeah. And then like it, toward the end of the series, like they did some real questionable shit to some of these characters. Like, like he becomes a cop. Like, really? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. The early seasons, like seasons one through three, and early season four, are like the best. And then after that, it sort of becomes a blur for me. Because then there was another episode that sort of like mimicked the Christmas Carol where it's like Eric is showing all the stuff in the future and we see them in the 80s and stuff like that and like where they could possibly go. And that's pretty funny. But um, also the flashbacks to like Red and Kitty in like the 60s, not the 60s, the 50s. Yeah, those are pretty nice funny. Too. Because they, they you all... You should look up the theory, like the, the theory of how fucking that 70s show and Happy Days connect. Oh, really? 
Yeah, there's like there's like a theory that like Red and fucking who's the neighbor with the perm, who's uh, Donna's Bob. dad, like that they were actually characters from the fucking Happy Days who <laughs> just changed their names after Vietnam. Hell no. It's a fucking it's an interesting theory, but it's like of course it's not true, but it's funny to think. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I really have to say. It's just, it's just a really just memorable show. You know, it, they had their concept and they, they stuck with it, you know? Yeah. And it was good because this was, this started in like 99 and you know, the nineties were very reminiscent of the seventies and stuff. Yeah. Like so it, it was came a, out like the perfect time. Yeah. Cause all, and all, all everybody's like parents were like 30. Values. 30 getting close to 40 and you know they they they're pretty much nostalgic for their their teen years you know that show is very much for the uh, the parents of the family like that that's probably why my because when I look at the show now uh, when I watched it back then I was like wow was this the 70s but now when I watch it I'm like ah, eh, this is just kind of throwing out the the more popular references just for the sake of my parents which isn't a bad thing at all because like i can't wait till like like, this is the 70s yeah i can't wait till we actually have a 90s show and it's like we have a grunge character and you know we have a goth character and we have you know you know what i mean like so i wouldn't mind to do with that 80s show like dude that was awful yeah, I always want to do a parody of fucking Evil Dead and call it that evil show. And it's like as they're like listening to the tape recorder, it's like spinning around the camera because they were supposed to be high in the in the original Evil Dead. That the cameras spin around. I'm like, hey, we found this tape. Let's play it, man. Yeah, that's why. That's why in the in the TV show he reads the book stoned off his ass. Yeah, <laughs> he just gets stoned and reads it. Like that's such an ass thing to do. He knows how bad it is if he were to fucking him out of anybody knows how what what evil will happen if he reads it. But he just smokes a joint with his chick one day and he's like, "Hey, check out this book." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, what is your number three? My number three is uh, Titus. Another one that I am not familiar with. All right, it's uh, an American sitcom starring. Uh, Christopher Titus, the stand-up comedian, and it has Stacy Keach playing his dad, and uh, what's his name? What's that guy's name that like you never? Is his name Zach Wild or some shit playing his brother? But uh, well, Zach Wild is the guitarist for Oh yeah, never. Ozzy what am and I thinking Black of? Black Label Society. I am stupid, man. What am I talking about here? Let me Google this real fast. Um. He he played Nikolai for like five seconds in the Resident Evil uh, TV show. I mean, t- Resident Evil Two movie. My bad. Yeah, I was about to say there was a Resident Evil TV show. <laughs> yeah, like fucking Jesus Christ. It's bound to happen one day. Um, what's his name here? Casting. Uh, his brother Dave is played by Mother. Fucking, here we go, here we go, Zach Ward, Zach Ward, he played one of the bullies that gets his ass beat on A Christmas Story when he was a kid. Oh, sweet. Yeah, and like, he in the show, he's like this total fucking stoner, and he's a complete idiot, and he's, Titus, like... Have seen the fucking bullies from Christmas Story when they grow up? Like, I don't know if it's the same actor, <laughs> but like, when you watch Freddy vs. Jason, there's the character whose brother, like, killed himself and Freddy fucks with him and he's played by like the main bully from the Christmas story I'm like what the fuck are you doing here man yeah still playing evil people but uh Titus man is uh based off of the stand up comedy of Christopher Titus and like a lot of his comedy is pretty dark it deals with uh, his mom was schizophrenic his dad was an asshole but his stand-up is is real funny and he basically tells you a lot of his life stories and so the TV show was sort of based on his life and just a little more exaggerated and uh, it was one of the first shows that did that uh, 
slightly popular thing where like in the early 2000s your main character is kind of like talking to the camera and explaining the situations and shit like Like the Bernie Mac show yeah like Bernie Mac and Malcolm in the Middle you know it was like one of the first shows that did that but it was it was Christopher Titus up there you know setting up the episode and he's basically telling you what's happening you the viewer he's like can you believe this kind of shit blah 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 this happened and it was really cool, and it was also one of the first shows to do cutaway jokes, and uh, they were really damn funny, man. Like they would they would cut away to when him and his brother were kids, and it would show you some of the fucked up shit his dad has done. Like, um, yeah, like cutaway gags work when they're like they could be done well, but like they've sort of been ruined by like the age of family guy where it's yeah. done like every two seconds. Yeah. Like they would, they would do a scene. They talk about, they would talk about like, man, I, you can't, you can't get, you, you can't get our dad to do this because you remember what happened that last time. And it shows him he's like six years old and his dad walks in there and he's like, uh, God, how do I, how do I break this to you? Uh, son, I ran over your dog. And you know, it's like, God damn. <laughs> um, but, uh, like, yeah, there was a lot of stuff like that. It would cut to when they were kids doing stupid shit, and then, uh, you know, like, every episode, uh... You there? Huh? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, no. Uh, you can't hear me? All right, hold on a second. I'm just gonna recall this dude. Gonna recall this dude. Real quick. All right, so are you there? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Technical difficulties, of Weird. course. Yeah, the I have, staple of our show. Yeah, I have no idea. I, I was hearing you. I guess you couldn't hear me. But yeah, the show. Yeah. yeah, the show was real relatable to me because you know my family was a little weird like that too. Not as fucked up as some of the shit. Yeah, uh, you guys were, like, okay with your weirdness and stuff like that. It didn't get to the point where it's like you guys were, like, dysfunctional. Yeah, you know, like, you know we were just dysfunctional enough, you know, but that... Yeah, you know, not every... Like, there's no such thing as, like, a fully functional family. But... Yeah, exactly. And, like, it was, a, it was a great show, and it lasted about three seasons. And to me, it was one of the more underrated and really one of the best shows that Fox had, had had in the early 2000s and to have Stacy Keach playing their dad dude like fucking he'd be smoking and he'd be drinking then he'd have a heart attack and he'd be still smoking and drinking and fucking like it was great dude like he'd come out there he'd make fun of his sons and shit and his mom was psycho and always trying to uh to kill the family whenever uh, she'd get out of the uh, mental hospital and but then like her and his dad would always wind up fucking, and then she'd go crazy and try to kill them all again. Like, it was real funny, man. It, they fucked with some pretty dark shit. And then I think one of the things that kind of helped get it canceled was one of the last episodes, dude, was, uh, was how, uh, it was right after 9-11, dude, about a year after 9-11, and, uh, they did an episode where they get on the plane and, you know, there's all this terrorist kind of shit going on, and all of a sudden, toward the end of the episode, I can't remember, I think it might have been his brother, who, he had a towel on his head, and shaving cream that looked like a beard, uh, and shit, and he runs out into the fucking, the aisle of the airplane, you know, just screaming and shit, and people are flipping out, and so they all get arrested by the, uh, the air police or whatever, and <laughs> it was pretty fucking funny. Yeah, like, it's funny now, but I guess... That's yeah, I guess American people weren't ready for recovering. it. People weren't ready yeah, for that like in 2002. I respect them for, like, going balls out like that. Yes, uh, so soon after it, you know, it was like, it was pretty fucking funny. Even at the time, yeah. I was like, wow, man, you guys are doing this? All right. Yeah, you just... You, whoa, okay. <laughs> uh, strap yourself in, folks. We're gonna have some turbulence. Yeah, it was a that was a damn good show. Um... I'll have to check it out. This sounds funny as fuck. Yeah, it's it's real damn funny. It it executes cutaway jokes better than most shows, and even the 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 main character talking to the camera shit is is much better than 
the Bernie Mac and all the other shows that kind of tried to do that and like to me it was it was a pioneering show that like a lot of shows you could see that tried to emulate it in the 2000s you know and you know I but I like these shows too like of course Louie is my favorite but I love all these shows that's like a comedian being the host like pretty much bringing this stand up to life like yeah. even when it's not that great like the Jim Gaffigan show is the, like the most recent one it's like the episodes are hit or miss but it's like it's still interesting to see like they have some pretty clever jokes on it from time to time. But Louie's my favorite just because of how just... And that's why I think I'm going to like this one, too, just because of how all out it goes, how it just holds <laughs> nothing back. Yeah, like, this show holds nothing back. It it gets it gets pretty fucked up, and, uh, especially toward, I think, season three when they, they go into uh, the plot line of his sister and like some of that shit gets a little fucked up but it's like hey it happened to his family in real life you know and he's yeah and I feel like you need that too because it makes it feel real and it makes the comedy more like it makes the comedy more like juicy you know what I mean Cause yeah. it's not just kind of gags and get, it's it feels more like life and although life is really fucked up it's got that weird odd sense of humor to it that the most fucked up things happen but the timing of it the pacing of it life is just a funny fucking thing life is dark comedy yeah so you might as well laugh at it or just like mope around and I'd much rather laugh about it yeah true that so what is your number two well since you mentioned Ash the moment this show premiered, I knew it was going to be one of my favorites. Yeah, I still got to. I still got to see season two. Well, it's coming out on DVD. It might have already come out on DVD. What? What day is it when we're recording this? Because I, I heard on Amazon like it's coming out August twenty second. Oh really? That's uh, this Tuesday, I believe. Yeah, so it'll be available then on DVD. Um, it's just a really good extension to the movie. It's just showing where Ash went. We talked about it when we were doing our top five horror movies. Just Ash has evolved so much yet so little. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like throughout the three movies we saw him evolve into like this chosen one badass. And then he like went back and turned into like this fucking schlub again. Yeah, and you know, it it just it has no problems giving the fans what they want, like, seriously. Yeah. And, um, like, again, not all of the jokes land. Like, in the second season, like, by the second episode, there's, like, a bunch of shit jokes and stuff like that, but it's one out of a million episodes, pretty much. So it's like, you you could have that. Because it's not like you're doing it every couple seconds, and it feels like it comes from a place of, like, yeah, this is still kind of evil deadish. Yeah. Uh, and I like how they, like, keep all the movies canon because, you know, Evil Dead 2 was essentially, like, half remake, half sequel. But now, since they have, like, the rights to all of them, they're like, nah, Evil Dead 1 is canon again. So are they able to put Army of Darkness in it, too? Yeah, Army of Darkness is canon. Like, there's a there's a time-traveling aspect in the second season and stuff like that. Okay. It's not really a spoiler. I'm not going into any more detail. But, yeah, he mentions that he was in the Middle Ages and stuff. All right, right on. Because I, you know, I remember when the show was first coming out, they had only they only had the rights for like Evil Dead two and one, and because what studio uh, put out uh, Army of Darkness? I can't never remember. Universal. Yeah, so they they still held on to them, and so I guess now they're and then allowed the right, to. Uh, the, then the rights to Army of Darkness went to MGM actually. Oh. Yeah, because there was like a video. There was like a little uh, app video game that came out and it was owned by MGM I think I could be wrong I'm pretty sure they own it now but um but yeah I guess since they didn't show many clips from Army of Darkness they could still like offhandedly mention it's like oh yeah I'll do that like when I went back into the Middle Ages see that that works yeah yeah that that show is great dude like I need to I need to finish that up I know yeah, my brother he just bought the first season on, on Ash's like Huh? Family, because like we we knew Ash, but we never really knew him. Now we see him like, now we see him like how he interacts with his family, like what his backstory is and stuff like that, where his hometown is, you know. Yeah. yeah so I feel like we're getting like the best guy. Ash we ever could, because we have like a broken down, beaten, just Ash who thinks he's still all that, but fucking, he's just he's 
he's one of those people who like changed but never did change. You know what I mean? Like he's yeah, just gonna grow and learn. He's, he's like no that how one dude. Tries. He's like that one dude we all know that basically peaked in high school, and he's yeah. still trying to relive the glory days, even though he's like pushing on fucking fifty. And I feel like he he knows when he learns his lesson, but he never wants to admit that yeah. he fucked up. Yeah. So he always just tries to like make it someone else's problem. But yeah, Ash vs. Evil Dead, I hope it keeps going. At yeah, least man. for four seasons, I hope it lasts. Because it's a godsend for like fans. It damn sure is. Because we waited so freaking long for it, man. And when the remake of Evil Dead came out, I just that to me was like the acceptance of, you know, if, I guess we're never gonna freaking get it, you know. I guess the video games were our true sequels and we have to just leave it at that. Yeah, but then the the remake without even knowing it actually brought interest back into the Evil Dead franchise. Yeah, was, so, thank God for that. So yeah, that, thank yeah, thank God it actually did well in the box office. Yeah, so even though like a lot of people they don't like the remake all that much. Like at they least, all went to see it. Yeah, at least the remake. If if people just complain about the remake, at least that could be some of the only good that it did. You know. I do think it's an interesting reimagining, but it's not I like it. I, I I will, I will never watch it as much as the original. Like the original is just always. Yeah, I, I saw it too. once in the movie theaters, and like to me, that's fine. Like. Fucking to be. Yeah, like if it's on, if it's on like some uncensored TV or something like that. Yeah, like because I enjoyed the hell out of it, you know. Yeah, it was good for what it was. One of the one but of the better the original uh, Evil Dead movies are just like on a whole nother level. Yeah. But that is my number two, Ash versus Evil Dead. Yeah. So my uh, number two is another British show. It is <clears throat> Black Books. So now you're hitting me with... You guys just got to keep explaining these, man. These are the ones I haven't seen. Black Books is one that I highly, highly recommend. Uh, it's on Netflix. It lasted, I believe, three seasons. It has... Um, I always forget the dude's name, man. Oh, but you know on uh, Shaun of the Dead. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. The uh, the new boyfriend of his girlfriend. The fucking uh, the dude with the glasses. Yeah, dude with the glasses. Yeah, yeah the dude who has the hots for it. Like, yeah, he was their friend. Uh, yeah, Dylan yeah, Moran. David. Dylan Moran. He, yeah, he's funny. He plays Bernard Black, and he owns a uh, a bookstore, and. <laughs> He has this guy named Manny come work for him, and there's a lady that runs a, a weird sort of uh, tre trinket shop next door, and they're always hanging out, and they're all complete burnouts. They're all fucking, like, Dylan Moran is a fucking alcoholic, chain-smoking, never combs his hair, always wearing the same shit that he went to sleep in. And he just he just hates life, but just lives anyway. And uh, like Manny's a little more optimistic, and uh, and then um, what's her name? The damn woman, man. Why do I always? I never remember character names, dude. Like fucking seriously. Um, I do like a script one day where it's like characters don't have names, like they're just known as the damn woman. And stuff like that. Yeah. Like so, Sin City, like that yellow bastard. Yeah, her name is Fran, and she's a com she's like a complete uh, borderline psycho, and they're always they're always hanging out in the bookstore, getting drunk, and or or getting into fucked up situations. Like there was there was one episode where they wanted to turn the bookstore into a nice fine dining restaurant, and. So they're in the back, like the the place is disgusting. It's uh, it's dirty. There's dust on all the books. Like nothing's ever clean. And they're in his kitchen, and they're supposed to be cooking some kind of soup. 
and there's these rats that they got to keep killing and like one at one moment Manny pulls out a damn crossbow and shoots a rat and uh the rats take take off with some of the food or the wine or something and like it just becomes a chaotic mess and he's like you know we we don't have the food for the for the soup and he's like oh who cares Oh, oh, my, my, my kitchen could cook bits of oven. So he starts taking off the oven knobs and throwing them in the freaking soup pan and starts stirring it around and shit, dude. Like, it gets, it gets chaotic as fuck. Like, it's, uh, it's on the vein of, uh, it's on the same lines of something like Faulty Towers, but on a more smaller scale and, like, on an even more fucked up level. Yeah. And, uh, like, there's, there's one where, this, this shit was great, like, they're talking shit about this children's book, they're like, man, anybody can write a children's book, and it'll be the greatest thing in the world, man, just anybody can do it. So they make a bet with, uh, with Fran that they can have a children's book finished by the end of the night. And she's like, all right, well, when I come back tomorrow, you know, you better, you better have that book made, and, you know, you owe me money or whatever. So they fucking spend the whole night getting drunk as hell, and they write this children's book, and it's a little decent book. It's about six pages long, and uh, they're like, "Wow, man, we we really wrote the greatest children's book in the world." And they're like, "It must never be seen. It must it'll it'll destroy all children's books. It must never be seen. We gotta burn it." So they burn the fucking book, dude. And the next morning, she shows up. And she's like, "Oh." We're, Where's that children's book? And they're like, we we made the best children's book. And like, well, where is it? Oh, oh, we we burned it. And <laughs> like it was great, dude. Then there's an episode where where Simon Pegg shows up as a uh, he runs like uh, one of those new style bookstores, like uh, like Books a Million or something like that, where you get coffee in there and all this shit. And like he's yeah. a complete asshole. Like man, he goes to work for him. For uh, for an episode, and he's just a complete dick, and, and like it's just real funny, man. They're fucking, they're asshole characters, and like I don't know, bro. The the British just have really good fucked up characters, like. And then there's some of that weird surreal kind of British shit in there too. Like there's an episode where him and Fran go on some kind of double date, and they keep going under the table to talk to each other. But when they go under the table, there's, like, a little bar and a fucking bartender under the table. And, like, they're getting drinks from the guy. And it's like, what the fuck is this? What is going on here? Just sometimes weird shit is funny. <laughs> yeah. Just sometimes asking, like, what the fuck am I looking at is funny in its own right. If it's done well. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm definitely, like, putting these shows in the back of my mind. Like, I'm checking them. Like, I gotta check some of this shit out. Yeah, Black Books is uh, probably... Probably my favorite uh, British comedy, like with a with a with an honorable mention, you know, I'd say Monty Python's Flying Circus, because that shit's just great. But yeah, like I love British comedy, but like I just haven't gotten around to it. But I remember when Adult Swim was playing the the UK version of The Office, like that was before I even watched the American version. So that was the one I was used to, and then I started recently watching the American one, which is even funnier. But like. Ricky Gervais is just such a funny motherfucker. Yeah, you know the 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 Office to me was pretty funny for for a couple years, and then the, after after old buddy left the show, it just kind of eh, there were still good episodes, but it kind of went a little downhill. But, yeah, uh, everyone does that. I wound up I wound up liking that Parks and Recreation a lot more. I've heard that's a good one too. That one was uh, that wound up being a lot better than the Office to me. But uh, I, I actually have never seen the British Office actually either. I like I barely remember anything of it, but I remember like those nights I would stay up as a kid and it was on. Like I, it would, it would like keep my attention. Like, it was my introdu- it was my introduction to Ricky Gervais's comedy, and I was like, this guy's pretty fucking funny. So what is your number? Are you on dose now or one? I am on. One. Oh shit! Drum roll. Um. So as I was hinting at with that '70s show, this is another show that takes place in the '70s. Um, but it's more raunchy. It's uncensored. It's on Netflix, and it's a cartoon. By oh, I know what you're talking about. Yep, arguably my favorite 
comedian of all time, Bill Burr. This is F is for Family. And it only has two seasons, but they're working on the third one. And just, it's Bill Burr's comedy to a T, but it, even though it's a cartoon, it just feels so real because each season has like an ongoing story. Like, it's not like a new adventure every time. Like, yeah, shit happens, but it's like, it always continues into the next thing, you know? Like, even that 70s show, like, yeah, there was still drama about, like, Red losing his job and stuff like that, but it was never, like, the main point of the episode. Like, F is for Family, each season is an ongoing, like, story. really deals with that shit. Yeah, and they, the comedy is great, and the reason why it's so great is because, again, it's not afraid to be real. We show just how fucking dysfunctional this family is. There's a moment where, like, just how fucking real it gets. Like, there's no other way to put it. And almost, like, oddly relatable in a way. Like, like you said with Titus, it's like, I didn't grow up in a fucking, like, total dysfunctional family, but there's some shit that, like, you can relate to. You know, that moment where your mom is so pissed off that the fucking littlest sound you make, she's just like, shut the fuck up! <laughs> yeah, like, that, that happened in the show. That cracked my shit up, because I'm like, that's some real shit. Like, where you have annoyed your mother no fucking end. That the littlest like creak you make in your room, she's done. <laughs> yeah, I've been there before, um, man. And then there's a yeah, she goes, she the mom goes in there and like has a rolled up piece of fucking newspaper and starts just hitting them. <laughs> like, I got when, when you're done, I got a little story to tell you that I got I got to tell on air. Here. Yeah, and uh, but yeah, it's just it's not afraid to get away with like risque humor because since it takes place in the seventies. It's not going to try to be PC for the sake of being PC. It's like, no, the men are, like, misogynist while the mom is trying to, like, make make a living. Again, you know, when she starts announcing that she's getting a job, the dad's like, no, you, you can't get a job. <laughs> like, yeah. you got to stay home. <laughs> like, fucking Frank Murphy is just, like, one of the angriest but, like, funniest motherfuckers. And just then the son's all into smoking is. weed and listening to prog albums, man. Yeah, the fucking son, played by Justin Long, is fucking just your total prog head. He's starting his own prog band and stuff like that. Fucking Their awesome. neighbor is, like, a hippie who, like, owns, like, the radio station and stuff like that, or, like, hosts it, so he's really rich. Um, you know, it just hits you at every level of your life. Like, fucking, there's the little kid, Bill who his stories, you know, has a lot of stuff you can relate to from when you were, like, that age. Then you have fucking Kevin, who is the teenager, which you can remember being in that teen angst phase. And then I'm assuming when you get to Frank, just being that angry old man who's, like, been through some shit and, like, never really learned, like, hopefully you can learn not to be like him, but, like, you might possibly just... It's just human nature that you might end up like him somewhat. Yeah. That just, like... You just get so sick of life and everything's a problem, but, you know, you find the shit you enjoy, like, sitting down and watching TV. <laughs> yeah, because, like, I've only seen maybe the first five episodes, and I, I, I kind of just forgot about it, like, but I, I, I thought it was pretty good, like. Yeah, once you, like, really get into it, the second season really starts to just fuck it. Because now the second season, like, well, I don't really want to spoil anything, but, like, Frank's in, like, a really big fucking slump. So it's, like, you got this whole character arc going on. But, like, I was going, like, it's not afraid to, like, hit you with, like, some sad, dramatic shit. Like, there's just a moment where the mom is just home alone. And she's just sitting there in silence after getting her work done. And then she just starts fucking crying. And it's like, oh man! But then they ease it up with comedy because the dog starts randomly humping her leg. Yeah. Like it's hard to explain. That's like how good the show is. That you just have to kind of see it to believe it. But it's been one of the few shows. Cause like I said, I'm not a huge TV guy anymore. I hope like Netflix counts. But like, it's just one of those shows that's like this is what I've been recommending to people like forever now. That like I've been showing all my friends and stuff like that. I'm like this show is comedy gold. It really is. Like, it's just Bill Burr's style to a T. But instead of just doing, like, the Bill Burr show, he, like, somewhat based it off of his childhood and stuff like that. Yeah, like, 
It's it seemed like it was really good, man. And I don't know. We watched uh, we watched a handful of episodes, and then I just kind of forgot about it. Like that though, that happens a lot too. Is like we'll watch some show and then just kind of forget about it. Like fucking like for one for instance is like Doctor Who. Like we watched the first two seasons of that and just kind of forgot about it and. Fuck yeah, it. sometimes you, like, get into shows, you get out of them. Like, I lost interest in The Walking Dead and stuff like that. Yeah, God, dude, that show is awful, but I watch it every year just so I can bitch about it. The first season was good. Man. The second season was okay. The third season in the jail was good. But, again, Yeah, the first yeah. season was great. second season was pretty awful until about the end. And then, yeah, at the prison, a little, little more interesting... But then the Woodbury shit kind of got, just turned into a cartoon. Like, the only thing about this past season that really got me into it, and I know people are sick to death about here, but I thought Negan was fucking great. And well, yeah. Anytime. The only, thing I, the only thing I miss about Negan is that in the comics, going back to Henry Rollins, Negan was, in the comics, was designed after Henry Rollins. Yeah, like, yeah, his yeah. His design was based on it. And Henry Rollins actually auditioned to play Negan. Yeah, and it would have been the great. Other dude, the other dude who played the comedian in Watchmen, like, beat him, and Rollins actually, like, said in an interview, it's like, you know, I could see why he got the role, you know? He kind of was just the perfect pick. Yeah, he's just got that charm to him, man, that But then again, ass... I would have loved to see Henry Rollins just be intense as fuck, and just beating yeah. Glenn into a yeah. fucking pulp. Like, that first episode of last season was, like, so fucking good, dude, that it was so intense. I was like, oh, man, this season's gonna be good, man, fuck. I guess and that's then, why Negan is so intense, because he always has, like, that charisma to him that it's, like, it's almost like you know he's going to fuck you up, but he's going to smile doing it, whereas, like, Henry Rollins, like, you just know. Like, yeah. he'll just come in there just dead stare at you. But, yeah, like, like... yeah, well, he's going to die. But after but, that know, first like, episode... I always wanted Glenn to die. I know everyone's going to hate me for yeah, saying that, but I he's a fucking death hated so much him, that dude. if I actually got to see Henry Rollins beat his face in... Yeah, I, I hate all the characters. Oh, shit. Poor connection. Like, there's no characters on there that I really like at all. <laughs> so it was like, I'm glad y'all uh, fucking... Uh, huh? Can you hear me? Uh, shit. Can you hear me? Did you, did you hear me there? Yeah, I could hear you. Okay, good. I heard you too. My connection just got poor. But like I was saying, like if I got to see Glenn get beaten down by Henry Rollins, that would have been a dream come true. Yeah, that shit would have been great. But yeah, after that first episode where they just destroy fucking Abraham and uh, Glenn, the rest of that season was garbage. Unless, to me, when, when Negan was on screen, I was like, hell yeah, I was enjoying it. But... All the shit in between. Like, Rick has just become such an annoying fucking character. God, dude. All of them, man. Just Christ. But, I mean, uh... I like Carl, but, like, everyone seems to hate Carl. I'm like, no, he actually seems to have, like, a character arc going. Yeah. Like, when he get Like, all of them got mad when he was, like, yelling at his dad, like, when he was fucking, like, unconscious. But I'm like, this dude has had to deal with this fucking asshole Rick his whole <laughs> life. Yeah. Let him have this. Yeah, but yeah, so let me tell you this quick story. You had mentioned about when moms go crazy and it's like the slightest thing will make them go over the edge. Yeah. One, of, one of the greatest moments in my childhood, and it, was, uh, it was a triumph in driving our mom crazy and a triumph in turning her punishment into just bullshit. Uh, she went nuts one day and... Uh, she was tripping out, and, well, the, <clears throat> one of her little, she had these hollowed out eggs that she would paint, well, one of the cats had knocked it off, and it got a little, little cracked. She thought we had done it. So she's gonna be like, this was back in, like, 95, dude. I'm nine, my brother is seven. So, she looks at us, and she's like, y'all have two hours to enjoy every toy that y'all have in your bedroom because in two hours I'm gonna come in there with a hammer and I'm going to crush every single toy that y'all own. And <laughs> Jesus Christ over an egg. <laughs> yeah dude. So me and my brother, man, we go in our bedroom, we shut the door and we're like, alright, we have two <laughs> hours. What can we do here? And uh, you know, how can we hide the toys that we like? without her knowing, because she'll know if we left the room and hit him somewhere else. 
You know, where can we hide them in this room where she can't destroy the toys that we like? And we'll just leave her to the bullshit that we're just going to break anyway. So my dad, he's a musician. He had a bunch of empty guitar cases in, uh, in my closet. So we took all the fucking action figures we liked, all our Mortal Kombat action figures, the fucking the Street Fighter, you know, Spider-Mans, and all that shit. Put all our cool action figures up in the guitar cases. Because, you know, our mom's not going to look into the, the guitar case. Yeah, so we, genius. Dude, we hid them all in there, right? So everything that was left was like Hot Wheels cars, McDonald's. Fuck them. Yeah, McDonald's Happy Meals and shit, and fucking... So we're like, you know, the, everything left is just bullshit we don't care about, dude. Stuffed animals, you know. Well, so she actually went through with it. Yeah, so she comes in there, dude, and she just starts hammering away. Hammering away, dude. And me and Zach are just in the living room just watching cartoons like, yeah, man, we got her. We got oh, her good, man. Christ, man. Dude, she is destroying everything. Even down to, like, <laughs> dude, even down to me and my brother, we each had a skateboard at that point. She hammered a hole through the fucking deck of the skateboard, dude. <laughs> it was like, wow, you are going all out. And she, over a, one fucking egg. Over it, a fucking it, egg, it dude. It have been one egg. It had to be a couple of them. I mean, dude, on. it was one fucking egg, man. Jesus One Christ. fucking egg, bro. And fucking dude, like me and Zach are just laughing. We're like, we're getting away with this, man. We're getting away with this. It's totally working. And you're just making her look like a buffoon. Exactly, dude. And she's destroying Happy Meal toys and just crap, dude. And she's throwing them all away. She's making remarks like she's a badass, you know. And we're just like, whatever, whatever. And so, yeah, she never found the toys in the uh, the guitar cases. <laughs> and she threw all that shit away. Really, she just cleaned our room for us, basically. Yeah, pretty much. She got rid of the shit you don't need. <laughs> yeah. She cleaned, she cleaned it out. <laughs> she ripped up the stuffed animals. Like, like it was so funny, man. It was so yeah, you're fucking... You're like nine. You don't need stuffed animals. <laughs> yeah, dude. We're like, this is fucking hilarious. This is great. She was still doing it when our dad came home from work, man. And, uh... You know, we're telling dad about it, and he's like, well, damn, you know, shit. <laughs> and mom's telling him, she's all bad, I'm breaking all their toys, they, they, uh, they don't care about anything. Uh, and we're just like, no, nah, whatever. Well, for about, so we basically got away with that, you know, she didn't find those. So for about a, uh, a good six months, we had to kind of play with those toys in secret. <laughs> Yeah, she thought she got them all. Yeah, she thought she got them all. It was great. It was hilarious. And a nice, nice point in the Jones family history. So it wasn't, so now that it's been a good, like, many years, you sure it wasn't you or your brother who broke them? Uh, well, yeah. you know, me and him did break things before the egg. Yeah, no, it was, I'm talking about the egg. What, like, are you free to admit that maybe, or was it really not you? We didn't break the egg that made her go off the edge, but we had fucked a lot of her shit up. That, so that would make her think that you guys did it. Exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> so it was kind of all that building up. Yeah, it was all that building so it up. it technically wasn't one egg. That yeah. was like the story. <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was just like probably a month of us, you know, driving her up the fucking wall. Yeah, and all it, all that just fucking... That makes more sense, because this whole time, I'm like, over one egg, it's like, no, nah, that one egg was, like, yeah. the final egg. Yeah, it was the final egg, but definitely an egg. Yes, still an egg. A, a hollowed-out egg, too. You're not missing any fucking, like, nutrients or anything. Yeah, you know, she, my, mom was a, my mom was a drawing artist, and she had, you know all these sketches that she had framed up on the walls and stuff and you know she's pretty good freaking stuff man she was pretty good at it she just never uh never really did anything with it but yeah, like, it, like it your family seems kind of cool though because it's like you come from like a creative family your dad's like a musician and your fucking mom's an artist so it's like yeah she had a she actually drew these uh port in the kitchen she drew these portraits of uh laurel and hardy and lucy and ricky on the wall and uh it was pretty cool, man. It was pretty rad. <laughs> yeah, so there's okay for a little bit of craziness to be in the family, because 
craziness comes with creativity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so was that your number one? That was my number one. F is for family. Okay, so my number one is uh, there's. Is it British? No, it's not. Oh my God! Yeah, what? We're back in the states, man. Yeah, we are back in the states, and in a in a very particular uh, state. Um. This is It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You know, I haven't watched enough of this show to, like, put it on my list, but it is a funny fucking show. I could totally see why you put this as number one, because what I've seen has cracked me up. Dude, that is, to me, the probably one of the greatest comedy shows I have ever seen in my life. Well, it right is. off the bat, you got Danny DeVito, who just is such a funny fucking guy. Just Yeah, dude. Him, like, on the first season, Danny DeVito wasn't there. Dude, Sonny is one of the few shows that from episode one, it knew exactly what kind of show it wanted to be. And it has never deviated from that. The show is on, like, season 12 now. Yeah, it's and like South Park, where it's like, it was what it was from the beginning, it knew exactly what it wanted to do, and it never let up. Yeah, and it continues to do it, and like, some of that shit gets pretty fucking dark, and, but... And it just doesn't get old, though. Yeah, fucking hilarious, dude. I can turn on... how to write it well. I saw the episode where they were kind of parodying uh, Eyes Wide Shut, where it's like, what's the password? And yeah. Fucking David yeah. Or G. You had these fucking, just... You know they're 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 fantasizing about having all these hot people at the orgy, but they get there. You know it's all motherfucking just you know very unflattering people, I guess. You know and they're all eating the buffet. You got these hairy naked dudes eating off the yeah. buffet, and <laughs> come on, dude. Like there. That makes sense. You're like if you went to like an orgy in some dude's apartment, come on, that's what. You yeah, like. seriously. And what I love is like they're all different levels of crazy and psychotic and they they get they get crazier and crazier with with each season like even like one of my one of my favorites is is Dennis man like he is such a he's a borderline rapist like <laughs> it's it's it sometimes it gets pretty uh pretty intense it's like wow man the, the, the way this, like, this guy's a horrible person yeah it's like they're all like he uh, they're all horrible people but in, in a way he's definitely probably the worst out of all of them because like dude there's there's the episode where they buy the boat and he's all like man i can't wait to get some girls on the boat man they they won't have they'll they'll have to have sex with us you know because of the implication and like mac is like what are you implication what are you talking about he's like well you know, we're, we're going to be in the middle of the ocean. Where are they going to go? They'll have to have sex with us. The implication. He's like, dude, you're making me real uncomfortable right now. Yeah, it's like, what yeah. the fuck? <laughs> and like, dude, like, it, it, it gets so... Uh, well, it's at that point where it's like, he doesn't really realize it's Yeah, great exactly. He doesn't realize how psychotic he is because really, he thinks he's the smartest out of all of them. And... He, he'll fucking say and do shit that's like, oh my god, this dude is fucking psychotic. Like, there's there's one of the newer episodes where him and Mac move in together, and Mac is always kind of like, he's almost like an in-the-closet gay, but like, he doesn't know how to accept it. And, like, so they move in together, and you get this relationship dynamic where, like, Mac kind of turns into this, uh, like, homemaker... And freaking Dennis, he just kind of goes crazy because of work and shit and the neighbor, and it escalates to uh, to some hilarious shit. But uh, what's crazy is the first season doesn't have Danny DeVito in it. Uh, but the first season is as good as all the later ones. But It's just good writing. Yeah, but when adding Danny DeVito... There's a character named Charlie on there. Adding Danny DeVito kind of made Charlie's character a lot better because when you watch the first season, you're like, ah, oh, Charlie's just your standard kind of gross dude. But when they add Danny DeVito to the bunch, him and Charlie together 
are yeah, such. Yeah, I'm like, because that's usually what I hear with Always Sunny. It's uh, isn't Danny DeVito's character named Frank? So it's like Frank and Charlie. Yeah, Frank and Charlie together are like two of the grossest motherfuckers together. Like they it's like they found they found a dynamic. Yeah, they they sleep together on the same nasty mattress. Uh, uh, it's like a, it looks like a fold out couch bed in the living room of this cheap, nasty, disgusting apartment, and. Like, there's an episode where, like, Frank keeps shit in the bed, and they keep waking up every day with a turd in the bed, and, like, you have this big mystery of, like, who shit the bed, man? And they go through all this shit trying to determine... Literally. Yeah, who's fucking... Who's fucking turd this is? And then finally, at the end of it, Frank's like, it was my turd. <laughs> God damn, dude. But, uh... You have, um... You have... Like, an episode, you got a Juggalo in there where they fuck with the Juggalo dude. Like, dude, like, it's... It gets real fucking funny, man. And, like, even down to, like... There's an episode where you find out Charlie was molested. And... It's something on the lines of, like, damn, you know, why didn't he molest me? Am I not... Is, am I not good enough to be molested? I can't really remember how that episode went, but... It was on the lines of that. It was like, wow, man, you guys are really getting on some touchy shit right there. And fucking, dude, there's one episode where <clears throat> they go to these uh, th these people's wedding and somebody puts bath salts into the, uh, the punch. And, like, so everyone is, like, going crazy and they all think that, like, they're thinking they're, like, real zombies and shit, but it was bath salts. And, uh, dude, it, it, it never... To me, there is, like, no weak episode at all. It, uh... Yeah, man. It's definitely on my list of stuff to check out. Like, I can turn on any random-ass episode from any random-ass season and just laugh my ass off. And with that being said, that concludes the revival of Fresh from the Basement. Yeah! So... My mom's been trying to ring me this whole time, so <laughs> I gotta skedaddle. Alright, dude. Before he starts breaking all of my toys. <laughs> yes, before he starts breaking all your toys. Alright, man. So we'll see you guys on the next uh, Fresh from the Basement. Yep. Later. Later.